first of all, I like to say, and I ASP gonna find me, because I wanna be a part of this fucking jump wannabe tennis tour. You know, I think they got their his testicles so far out their mouths that this is bullshit, you know? I'm not thinking about that right now, I'm just thinking about having won the world title and, and hopefully trying to win another one someday. You just drop in and just smack the pull back, drop down, say bah! Well, I'll tell you, Stu, I did travel some humongous waves. Oh, that's the table thing? Oh, surf looks good, Alvin. Not bad. Ain't that swell with Jed and Vaughn. Oh, those guys are back! <laughs> Get a haircut. Yes, Shredheads, Waxheads, Kooks and Barneys, welcome to Ain't That Swell, the radio show and TV show dedicated to cutting fucking sick. I'm your host, the two-time Gold Cone Peace Award-winning <laughs> surf journalist, Scum Valley's finest himself, the punch-drunk pikey, the sultan of psilocybin, the maestro of micro-dosing. And I'm joined here, as always, <laughs> by my world. Oh, I didn't even introduce yeah. myself. Smivy. Smivy. <laughs> Fuck, something always goes wrong. <laughs> I'm joined here, as always, by my loyal co-host and friend, frontman of the Goons of Doom, former editor of Surfing World Magazine, Waves Magazine, Tracks Magazine, Vaughn Corn. Deadly, welcome to the program. Are you excited, Vaughn? Mate, I have got that much froth going on. I've got veins sticking out of me temple, and I'm about to let rip and maybe even bust a little nug, because we have got the power, the passion, the grunt of a very special guest on the show tonight. That's right. Let's uh, welcome him on. He was a world tour icon in a golden age of competitive surfing. He went searching with Tom Curran before he had pubes, cut clean lines alongside AI at J-Bay, locked horns with the goat and doused himself in piss with Eugene Fenning. Renowned <laughs> for his hectic frontside hack attack and big steez in heaving Pacific orbs. Please welcome to Ain't That Swell, the core lord, comeback, kingpin, Nathan Oh, hey. When I'm back on my feet, I'm gonna take you down to Oxford Street and get you anything that you want. I'm making it up to you. Cause when I've got you back in my arms, I won't have to crawl. And I'll iron out all the kinks in my brain and get up off the floor. Cause you thanks, boys. Oh, yeah. Welcome, mate. Welcome to the show. This is a real pleasure. Mate, thanks for the invite. Stoked to come to the Stabbing Cabin. Mm. Yeah, it has been a Stabbing Cabin back here <laughs> on a number of occasions, although, uh, yeah, I haven't been doing too much Stabbing out here, mate. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, stoked to come down. Good to catch up, boys. Good mm. to see you, mate. Mm. What's news in the world of Hog? Mate, um, just been trying to get my gills wet where I can and, yeah, coming through, actually had a knee surgery probably about two months ago so just been getting back on the board and sort of you know just got the gra- gratitude levels back up it's been an ocean and yeah just trying to yeah weather the storm really the current current way of the world mm. Mm. uh we were chatting just before we we kicked off the show hoggy about the uh the big swells that uh saw us through that initial covid period and uh you got a couple of monstro cones on the uh, at the home break or, or just down at the little secret Beachy that no one knows about down there. <laughs> yeah. Um, thick wave. I mean, uh, how how does it rate, you know, Southie when it's really on and it, it's big and it's east and it, it's doing what it did on that, you know, those early swells? Because you've got a couple of heavers, mate. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it sort of reminiscent or it reminds me of Hossigore over in France. It's the way it smashes on the sand and comes out of thick water like you hear of the trench out there on, on um, Le Nord or... Um, the Gravier, mm. sort of along, along you, that you've stretch. You've had plenty of trench out in Lenord, haven't you, Smithy? Uh, what kind of trench are we talking about? Well, you know, I'm just... Plenty of trench. Yeah. Trench going, Smithy. Deep trench. Deep oh, trench, indeed. Mate. Yeah. So I'm a known <laughs> trench goer. <laughs> trench dweller. <laughs> trench, the whole trench and nothing but the trench. Um, yeah, so well, uh, just big, you know, big sort yeah. of unfiltered swell. Just just thick and raw and yeah. just when it hits the bank, it just unloads. Uh, and You're um, just like a, a truffle pig, aren't you? Just oh, uh, let loose in a field. Of, I uh, think um, fungi. Yeah, it's just some. I, I think like because we used to fish out there too. There's a couple of bombies, and it just for some reason um, apexes up and um, mm. gives a really nice angle on that stretch of the beach. And I know I always remember growing up, it was sort of more just the east swells. But this year it was handling south swells too, so it was weird. Mm. You know, so it saw me like a bit That's more right. of a close out, sort of a long funneling right. It's good for photos, but yeah. mostly close outs. Yeah. 
But this Monterati's year, licking his lips and yeah, no exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just getting the shot. The old Kodak Courage. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, no, this finest. yeah, mm. this year, um, it was good on the south, and um, I was lucky enough between you know travel restrictions and trying to juggle everything that um, I got to sneak into a couple. During those bit better days, yeah. Just I uh, got to give a shout out to Kobe Clements who packed up romper Smithy on that swell. Paddled it too, yeah. right? In amongst the step offs and whatnot. Mm. Yeah, I mean that wave looked like um, like an over in Indo or something, didn't mm. it? Hey, didn't it? Was it? So clean that 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 one left we're talking about. Had yeah, that one. Wave. Yeah, yeah, same, yeah, same, same wave. one for sure. Um, yeah, but, but you uh, you had a good crew out there, mate. Just uh, you know. But, I guess on days like that, uh, when we were groms growing up, yeah. you know, just down the beach from each other, uh, there was only ever a handful of guys who really <laughs> had a crack at those sorts of days. And yeah. now there's a, a heap of crew and it's, it's, it's uh, non-ageist. Like you got crew out there like, you know, Granger and Gribble and, um, mm. you know, kind of older guys who, who were doing a lot of tow around the area. And then the Mexicano boys are out there often, uh, Kizzer and that, and then... Uh, yourself and but then yeah this this next gen the Geordie Lawlers and then well, how old's uh how old is Kobe Clements he must be sort of near an eighteen now wouldn't he oh, I'd say he'd be around there eh mm. yeah I'd say he'd be around eighteen it's or nineteen a good vibe in the water right though, up isn't it? to Tommy Carroll yeah. even Tommy's packing yeah. a couple out there Tommy got the court come down from Av yeah he um he was just like so good to watch out there um it was around the time of the morning that we'd heard that Derek Ho passed away mm. and um. Tom had just got off the phone to Kelly and he said, look, I've got some sad news. And we just figured, look, we'd dedicate that swell on that particular session to Derek and um, the waves were going to come. And on his memory, we said like a little prayer and had like a meditation out of the, the water. And you could see Tom just kind of come into his own. And a couple of bigger waves came that kind of were like second reef reminiscent. And he kind of was coming with, off, coming off the this, this ski it was like snapping back and fading, and it's just classic Tommy. Fuck, did he did he sneak and up under you on the wave of the day? Was he, you paddling for one? He just got up underneath you, knocked it in like the uh, yeah, classic classic T. So you going? What do you reckon? What are you going? We going? <laughs> Isn't that uh, outrageous though? You, like you know, we lose uh, you know one of the uncles, one of the true tribal elders of surfing, yeah. and 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 his great uh, you know combatant. In Tommy Carroll gets gets a pipe swell just down the road from his home, bro. That's fucking cosmic. Yeah, it was um, yeah, pretty eerie, and just yeah, you could just see Tom really just went to another level, and obviously that respect and the um the love he had for Derek, he kind of brought it onto that session. And a couple of the waves were just that had that different look about them. They came mm. to Tom, and it's kind of hard to not think that um. You know, Derek had a part to play in that that morning. It was it was pretty sick to witness. Fuck, ah, that's cool. Yeah. Man. And yeah. talk to us about Tommy surfing. I mean, at his age, like riding serious, you know, hollow waves of consequence. He's, how inspiring is that? Oh, mate, he's such an inspiration. I mean, he just yeah, he done everything in the in the water and as far as the sport goes. And then you know, just how he holds himself now, he's just. Yeah, he just really connect with Tom a lot better. And, um, you know, he's just got, like, a real presence about him. He always has, I guess, but even more so now. He's just got all that wisdom and um, just holds the, holds the space really well mm. and um, just seems to connect. He knows sort of – we have a little bit of a joke. Um, it's kind of like slows the new fast. It's Tommy the turtle. He just sort of <laughs> – <laughs> eases, eases into things and you know he's, he's like a cat he just cruises and then bam you know he's yeah on. i was gonna say that it's like you yeah. know i know that you two uh do a lot of meditation yeah. um there's there's a lot of uh inner work happening there it's real conscious stuff you know yeah it's, you're it's, right it's, Vaughan, it's deciding yeah. how to be rather than letting your emotions and the passion and the froth take over but Mate, you two on a on an eight foot, <laughs> ten foot day in huge tubing lifts. Fuck off! You two yeah. are gonna froth out. I <laughs> know. Oh, it's it's like the one person who can out froth Tommy Carroll is the yeah. bloke sitting with us. Yeah, Must have looked like a heavy. cappuccino out there with you two mad dogs it's, paddling around each other. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just it's always in there, and it doesn't. It's always just bubbling up, bubbling mm. under the surface. It doesn't take much to kind of get the needle you know so it's about well, trying I to it, um, I don't know if I could yeah. honestly take your surfing seriously if you didn't have a vein popping out of your forehead oh exactly <laughs> yeah I've got a couple going right now <laughs> oh, yeah, there's well, always a vein or two popping out it's it's, it's um, awesome yeah I mean um, I get up in the mornings do the meditation with Tom and uh, we've we've towed a lot of swellings in, into that mm. and it's it's just so good for you mate like yeah, yeah it's been a, a full credit to you guys not just for 
finding that and uh, exploring that that pathway within yourself, knowing that you need it, but bringing other people in on it, mate. Like you know, like Smithy and I are always talking about things that have uh, helped us through uh, mental anguish or tough times or, or just the betterment of your own life. And, and you two are really like leading the way and showing people that it can be done with really simple steps too. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's just you know, it's um, I liked it sort of nothing outside of us like. It just comes back to us and it seems like attainable. You know, you can't mm. go live in an ashram or a cave somewhere. It's like, there's just some tools that um, for modern day living, you know, it's um, something that revolves around the ocean. And I think that's what surfing gives us too, like essentially waiting for waves or riding a wave. You're so present, you're in the moment mm. that, you know, you're not back and you're not forward for that little bit of time. You're actually right where you need to be just in that moment. So I think that's sort of, you know, what surfing gives us and... Um, any little top ups you can get when you're out of the water, it's got to be a bonus, right? Because mm. we're getting so much input these days, the nervous system's just getting so overloaded. Mm. Anything to um, bring us back to like a recalibration and just to sort of you know get back to what's what's happening right now has got to be gold, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Definitely. Now I did also see your lemon spread pop up on the idiot box hog uh, on the new rival series, mate. You're yeah. going nah. <laughs> yeah, it was a good good episode that one. Yeah, I reckon it was uh, one of my favourites. I think uh, I got to say that was probably the the best surfing I saw in the series. Um, you know, just in terms of just on rail speed, precision, aggression. Uh, a lot of the other quality episodes for mine were you know it was hollow waves, which are pretty you know for guys of your level, it's it's pretty kind of run of the mill stuff packing cones packing four six foot cones mm. but um that was like ct level surfing what did you uh make that rivals experience well i think like you know having you guys know some of my journey like i had seven years on the tour and i achieved a lot but i kind of then had to find my way and i obviously fell off the tour and had to get my life back on track so i kind of the guys that i got on with stayed on there so they they were on there for like 16 17 years right then I had like a 10 year, I had a few little wild cards and I came back on there for a bit, but I felt like I got a lot more fuel in the tank and sort of got some unfinished business, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So having the opportunity in that platform to surf with those guys and celebrate where I am in my life and to, yeah, just be be invited and included in that, I kind of really brought the intent and the passion. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, or I hope that came through in my surfing. And, you know, I don't live at Narrabeen anymore and there's so much, yeah, um, drive and memories and connection to that place so just having me back there on a normal free surf is enough that it, that that comes up you know i've got my dad <laughs> i can see my dad standing on the beach i've got all the memories all that you know the three generations coming through there and growing up on the lake and that whole deal so then if you put an opportunity to do the rivals comp with that you know there's there's a fair bit fair bit there you know what do you reckon, Smithy? Should we uh, should we dive in? Sure. Go back to the start because uh, that's that's a good a segue as any. Um, yeah, just I, I agree with you though, mate. That that spark is is so there. It's so obvious. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing better for myself when I get down to the Australian board riders battle and I see the Narrabeen team turn up with Captain Hoggy just you know beating the drum at the at the start and fair nickum. I mean, if you if, if you don't cut you open and find a black and white Narrabeen flag somewhere wrapped up around your organs, then there's something wrong because you, you are just <laughs> absolutely, you know, you live and breathe it more than just about anyone does for their, their home break. But let's let's dive into your life there. Well, just before, just before we get into it, I'd love to know, uh, I mean, your surfing is at such a high level and, uh, you know, you're not, you're not old. Like you, looking at Slater, he's 48. 47th, still on tour. Mm. Uh, now the WCL is kind of moving back to this regional qualifying series where we're, we're going to have a lot more, uh, a pathway that doesn't require you to leave Australia necessarily to get on the world tour, or at least, uh, you know, the, the kind of early stages of the qualifying series are going to be all held here. So are you thinking of having a crack, Hog? Mate, I'm just coming back from knee surgery and, yeah, I mean, I'm open to... I was more thinking towards the Masters tour, to be honest. Like, no. when's that, when's that, when's that going to happen, you know? But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a moving target. It's, um, I've still obviously got the passion, but I still, you know, in saying that, I love watching the new generation come through and I'm a surf fan and I'm quite happy to, you know, let the other guys have their time. I've, you know, had a, had a really good, incredible career and, you know, but given a chance and put the, the jersey back on, I still love love to compete. So, 
Look, I, I, just on that, uh, the, the, the number one thing that I was looking the most forward to with the, the change of the tour, the regional series, and then feeding into the Challenger series, then onto the CT, was exactly seeing guys like you serving it up to the young guys that you like watching coming through. Because uh, one of the big things that, uh, this is a theory I heard, it might have been Andy King, but I'm not sure. Uh, someone was saying, you know, one of the main reasons why Australian surfing has kind of lost a bit of its mongrel is because surfing has become quite insular in terms of like goal setting. It's not like you're going out there with a team and uh, forging ahead against, you know, the other nations. So that'll bring this back because, you know, when you were first getting on tour, there was a, a huge movement, uh, the LMB movement. Yep. And, uh, but just on top of that even, just a full nationalistic push yep. to try and combat this uh, momentum generation takeover. And that really mm. bred uh, a lot of success with uh, yourself, the Cooley kids, that next sort of wave that came through on the back of it. With the regional series, all these guys, they're going to be competing against each other, but they're going to be hanging together. Mm. And it's not just kids who have a bit of money yeah. who can go and get the good hotel and all this sort of stuff. By the time you start surfing in Challenger Series events, yeah. you've got camaraderie. Yep. And camaraderie helps push the surfing nations. Look what it's doing for Brazil. Mm. So I think that that's, uh, yeah. that's one of the big things. But having the elders, having the old boys, like showing these kids what passion is and like reminding them that it's not always going to be easy. And if you want to win, you've got to dig deep. Man, it's, it can only be a good thing for Australian surfing. Yeah, I tend to agree with you for sure, mate. Um, just thinking of our journey, like you'd have legs in the camaraderie and I guess going back generation before me too, it was the QCC, right? So the, the, the regional tour. That's as, right, as yeah. That was, it was the ACC. ACC. And then, uh, but the, even the Pro Junior Series, you guys had yeah. three or four years of getting to know each other, getting to know how each other surf, backing each other up. I remember seeing you... Uh, at Bondi in a pro junior, uh, mm. in, in the real power era of the Cooley kids. I think Mick yeah. and Joel might have even had CT wins by then. Yeah, right. But everyone was just frothing on you, on, yeah. uh, you know, you getting through these rounds at Bondi and cheering you up the beach. And yeah. it just had this, had this magic aura to it, man. You could feel that Australian surfing, despite the competitiveness of it, all the individuals, everyone loves seeing everyone surfing out of their skin and bringing the passion to it. Yeah, and I think the, you know, the camaraderie in travelling as a group, like, you'd have the legs like say to Europe you'd go for two months so you'd kind of be on the journey on the leg and whoever did best in the in the comp might pay for the hotel the hire car or you'd, you'd play cards to see who's going to pay for this and that and it just Smithy you're giving Smithy he's getting goosebumps here yeah he's, he loves yeah. this sort of stuff mm, he's backing just, up yeah. looking after your fellow man mm, looking after the battlers mm, mm, yeah or whoever whoever got the hottest chick got the double bed because other guys were <laughs> Sock on the doorknob. Yeah, exactly. Especially <laughs> over in over in WA at Preverly Park. It was that was the deal. <laughs> so it was just fun, you know, like just good times and breakfast of champs. We'd wake up and have bacon eggs on the barbie, baked beans, like just real, you know. Before I guess referring to Mick and Joel, like before big contracts came and stuff, it was just like yeah, sharing high car costs and just yeah, just getting from place to place. We weren't roughing it, but it was just more core. Mm, yeah, it was just mm. super real and um, not so insular. It was, mm. um, yeah, and I think that was the legacy that the Aussie boys, you know, planned to seed in us coming through. I think mm. that's the sense yeah. you get from it when you have that intergenerational atmosphere at a contest, a lot more grit, a lot more folklore, just the storytelling and just, uh, you know, learning about guys who were so close to being good enough. Maybe they were even better than the best, but for whatever reason, they didn't make it. All those stories, I think it's kind of lost when you're dispersed around the globe in this kind of inter international WQS kind of... Uh, well, it's also, uh, it's, just, it's just not possible for so many talented surfers to, to get there. You know, if you haven't got major support, uh, if you have a couple of bad runs, if I mean, look at... Uh, you know, Morgan Sibley, so he, he had a couple of guys he was touring with, uh, had a couple of shocking years, nearly gave it away and just had a good run. It's and crazy. I mean, how many times have we seen guys go, you know, this close, bees dick close and not quite crack it. And, and that could be put down to not a desire thing, but just a simple, you know, uh, fucking sticks and uh, dollars and cents yeah, kind of absolutely. thing. You know, you, you, you just, you can't be surfing your best if you're constantly stressing about, Where's your next paycheck coming from? Oh. But I mean, it, it worked perfectly for in the old, old days when they were building the sport. Yeah. But they also had the camaraderie. And so if you're doing that now and you haven't got someone looking after you or, or, or throwing down for a hotel room when you're having a shocker, the camaraderie just doesn't exist, right? Mm. So why bother? Mm. 
But anyway, it's uh, yeah, it's good. It's a, it's a good system. I can't wait to see what it does for Australian surfing. No, it's, it's going to be, be great to see. It's going to be great. All right, uh, that brings us to Hog. This is your life. Number five. The Hog Mob lands in Narrabeen. Take us back to how your family ended up there on one yeah, of the it was some great Australian waves. My dad, he, um, we grew up on the beachfront up at um, Sunshine Coast mm. and uh, my dad had built 20 units on the beachfront of Caloundra and um, the recession hit and um, so all the pre-sales of the units fell through and my dad's brother bought one to bail him out and then he was like, had to move to Sydney to try and find work and building and um, so we moved down to Sydney. Um, dad packed up the, mum and dad packed up the Connie Corolla, Toyota Corolla, <laughs> three kids. And we moved off down to Sydney and Dad um, wanted to keep us somewhat near the beach. We ended up moving out to um, French's Forest. Mm. And Dad was commuting into the city, building in the city. He was a foreman for like Leighton's or something like that in there and worked on the Clocktail building and did some really pretty amazing things in the city. And um, we'd go to DY on the weekends. Just, you know, I was still probably about 10 at the time. So I'd surfed every day up the sunny coast, learned to surf up there. Um, surf with Parco and that up at Double Island and sort of got my roots of surfing on the sunny coast. Mm. But then when I moved to Sydney, I didn't really surf for like a year or two or just weekends. D.Y., mate. Yeah. I, I thought growing up in Narrabeen was uh, a baptism of fire. But yeah. D.Y., yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so we, that's a, back in those years in particular, I mean, it, yeah. it was, it was he- like sure. hellish, but it was definitely mm. uh, had its own culture. Like it was totally yeah. separate. I was born in a bathtub overlooking D.Y. Point, actually. Oh, fair dick. There we go. There you go. Smithy. Did Smithy Did Peter trivia? Crawford deliver you into uh, <laughs> I, I think he was the shaman. <laughs> 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 Water <laughs> shot. <laughs> Coming out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, the housing in the bathtub. Yeah. So did, did you have a homemade one, PVC pipe and the whole deal? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> any so any good. memories of DY, mate? We, yeah, like, absolutely. Like, yeah. Those guys would have been absolutely. big I'm stars. A, yeah. Me. Shane Herring was mental. Um I just remember like looking up silhouette up towards Longy in the morning. He was just doing like big airs and big hacks and stuff. I remember the silhouette power. He'd always know it was him. Wow. Um, bunch of really good surfers from there. Um, but yeah, mum and dad had rented this place right at the top of the steps at the end of the point there. Mm. 143 Oaks Avenue. And um, just this little beach shack. And so I'd learned to surf in Kitty's Corner, the little, the little left in there. And then having the right point was also good for me. Like just having a bit of reef and some bigger waves. So yeah, we... Um, Lived there for like a couple of years and then um, dad had a mate who was surfing up at Narrabeen. He said, oh, you got to come up Narrabeen. The waves are a bit more hollow and mm. it's, it's pretty good up there. And so I went up there on one weekend and I got my first barrel up there, come out, claim. That's where, <laughs> that's where it started. Nothing's changed. That's where the claiming started, <laughs> right? So I don't even think I was in the barrel, but it sort of went over me, I think, and I felt that in the cone, in the, you know, that's that no noise. I felt like I was, you know, in the, in the, in the back in the womb or something. Was it, a, was it a double fist, clenching, screaming <laughs> at the heavens, veins popping Pro- out of your head claim? Probably. <laughs> a th- a, a th- 11 or 12-year-old yeah. version. Um, and then, yeah, I said to Dad, I could, oh, the waves so much better. They want to get up there, get up there. And then Dad, being the legend that he was and is still, um, moved us up there. Mm. And um, we lived on the beachfront in various different spots. And Dad was a builder, so he was kind of like building a bunch of stuff around Narrabeen. And... and um, I was just to surf Southie all the time because mm. that's where we lived down there. We'd have the tinny on the beach, me and Benny Lawson, and we'd just push it out and go fish the bombies and, yeah. um, you know, Aussie, and it was just all about Southie. And then one day we rode up to North Narra, and I remember Jesse Frain and Ank, Ank Kidman and Simon Kidman, maybe even the Banos were out, and we were trying to paddle out from the, from the end of the left, mm. trying to get out. And they're like, nah, come up to the alley, get sucked out here, and just showing us the ropes. And um, I just remember the waves being so long and so ruler edge and perfect. And we've seen Damien Harbin out there and all these guys. And from that day on, I just rode up every morning mm. up to North Narrabeen. And um, yeah, I think that's just where it all all started. Fantastic. Was yeah. it, it didn't take long for you guys to really just embed yourself in Narrabeen culture. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it wasn't like... Uh, it felt like you'd be always been a part of the fabric of Narrabeen from just about the second you moved there. Uh, I remember just, you know, going up there for surfs after work, seeing yeah. your little blonde curly locks flying through the yeah. pit like a, a surfing Shirley Temple. <laughs> um, how quickly did you sort of sense the the weight of the joint? Was was it obvious? Like, uh, did you have to join board riders before you started to go, oh, hang on a minute, this place is actually pretty serious. It's not just 
people showing me how to get out through alley rights and all that sort of thing? Uh, I think I just – there was just so much depth and so much talent mm. that, um, you know, obviously there's a few name guys there that I that I knew of, but um, just the level of surfing is what drew me there. Just the surfing that I was watching and seeing on a daily basis um, was what really set the hook for me, um, wanting to be out there and just aspire to – you know, like any, you just want to rise to that level mm. and seeing the caliber of surfers out there and the quality of waves, it's just, it was just so consistent, so good every morning that that's kind of what did it for me. Um, and then, yeah, board riders wise, I was getting chucked out as the grom at like 12 and 13, mm. you know, the different surf tag events and stuff around, Jim Beam ones and whatever else it was. Um, remember there's a Chris Bystrom film of me early, early days. I can't remember the name. Got but the Chris Bystrom collection right here, by the way. Yeah. Thanks, Josh, for sending those through. Exactly. Beyond um, Blazing Boards, Gravity Sucks. We've got to find that one. I know. And, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of waves of me. I am swear I'm like 11 or 12. And um, the last five minutes, just go out and get the quick last wave, the grommet. And um, I just remember that pressure of, like, you know, having to go out and get a wave. It's just really good for me, you know, being, being that young and having the pressure of the board riders there. <laughs> just putting the snout in the sand and just... Yeah, <laughs> just exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, go, get into it. So, um, And then after that, I think I did all right. And um, so, yeah, it was just sort of all about board riders then. And yeah. Yeah, talk to us about the big dogs at the beach at that time and your dynamic with them. I mean, who was, uh, who were the alpha males? Who were the mentors? Who was uh, likely to give you yeah. a mouthful in the lineup? Oh, it was a bunch of heavyweights there. Um, but, I mean, there was just heaps of combos of different guys. Um, the two Bannister brothers were amazing. Um, the Fitzy, all the Fitzy clan. Mm. Uh, and then you got, like, Danny Shallis and Richard Breeze and Chris Davo. Um, there was just so much depth. And then you got, like, the elders, like the pioneer guys, like in, um, like Simon um, Blackie and um, Damien Harbin, obviously, was right at the pinnacle of his career then too. And... I um, mean, there's so many. I'm probably forgetting half of them as well. Um, even like the female side of it too. Yvonne Rogan Camp was mm. right up there then, and I think collectively, just like between Manly up to Palmy, on any given day, you'd have like Potts was in the area. TC. Fuck, Barton. it was a wild era. For oh, the North Beaches. Surfing. It was it just the mecca. Of it was no, it, compared Potts to is, yeah. Potts is up at Whaley. He used to go up and train with Potts and Barton up at Whaley. Wow. He <laughs> <laughs> was running out the rocks and doing runarounds and stuff, and then because I knew him. A bit better than the other guys. I'd get invited back up to their place and yeah, we'd do a bit of extracurricular stuff up there. A couple of billies <laughs> after training. <laughs> a couple of, couple of extra push-ups and chin-ups. Uh, Pots. Those guys were in yeah. a, fu- a funny place in their careers yeah, yeah, around that time, just, weren't yeah. they? Yeah, what was going on? Talk us through the, uh, the Pots BL kind of shtick at that time. Oh, mate, they just still like, just remember catching them over in Hawaii and um, come back to Australia. They're just, just full ball, just going hard. Just, yeah, just, just maniacs. Because <laughs> they, yeah. they were basically in that, that period of trying to figure out what to do with life post pro surfer, uh, but still getting an, a, a little bit of coin and still having mm. a big profile and sort of, you know, that, that weird feeling of like acknowledgement, but it's not there. And it, it was a tough time, man, because the industry mm. kind of was raking in heaps and heaps of dollars, but it was all youth orientated. Mm. And so the, the legends and the elders, they weren't getting a sniff. Uh, so to speak, <laughs> uh, but the yeah, it was just it was a tough time. There was a lot of bitterness, mate. There was a lot of like you know anger uh, from guys who you know were hall of famers already, mm. but just not getting any sort of like opportunity to 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 help teach the next generation. But Barton and Potts just took it upon themselves to to start managing and training. They did. That was not yeah, part exactly. of any any bigger uh, system mm. that exists now. So. Yeah, it's good that those guys change, but that's what it makes me laugh is that, um, you know, like yeah. you, you would have gone into that, oh, uh, this, this into that, that sort of bizarre energy. Yeah. But also, you know, on one hand being told, this is, this is how we're going to make you succeed. And on the other hand, watching them just tear in like fucking <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's just sort of like your mentors and the guys that you want to look up to and be like too. So that's what it was like the first years on tour, you know, like you still had Sonny and Ock and Louie and, um, you know, it's just guys that had just finished up too, like boxing that. So it was kind of like, yeah, it was still remnants of just that gnarly, gnarly years on tour. And, um, mm. but being young and being sponsored by Rip Curl and going on these trips, it was, um, I got a real good glimpse of that stuff. And, um, yeah, it was, um, let's just say the duty of care might be a little bit different this day and age. Number four. All right, 
at number four in the life and times of Nathan Hoghedge, searching with Tom Curran at the tender age of 13 <laughs> years old, mate. Tell us, uh, tell us how that transpired. I just remember coming home from school and um, my dad said, look, we've got a call from Derek Hind. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's and, uh, normal. Yeah, LDH was DH calls. <laughs> How'd that um, convo go down? No, oh, I just, Dad, I could see it was just a look of Dad's face. It's, it was going to be good news. And they're like, oh, they want you to go on a boat trip, search trip. And yeah, they said they, they want you to go on a search trip up in, um, up in the Mets. And um, you're going to have to take some, we're going to have to go into school and see if they're going to allow it, talk to your teachers and see if we can um, get some homework. It's going to be a 28 day trip. Oh, <laughs> 28 days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So um, wow, that's like a fair percentage of a, of your life when you're 13. I know it was like the bottom of the chain, the men's right up to the Bunda Arche, and the deal was that you know I was the <laughs> grommet, and um, I'd go in with Martin Daly on the um, on the tender, mm. and I'd go in and try and find these waves and surf these waves because he was just it was just pioneering. It was uncharted area. <sighs> we we had the go-to spots of like Lancers and HTs around the Maccas and and um, other spots, you know, all the known spots, but mm. it was only one boat. There, there was none like, oh, let's go to this spot. That's going to be uncrowded. It was one boat. Mm. So we're just surfing on our own. You know, the kids coming out from the villages hadn't seen surfing. And wow. you know, sunny Miller days, it was just, we were the, you know, the first. I'm sure there was other boat trips up there early around that time. I know Quick were doing stuff as well. But when I was there, that first boat trip, I didn't see any other boats. We were sitting at Macca's, that, just us. Wow. No, no, no one else. And as a 13-year-old, you know, you're a 13-year-old from Australia, this, you know, relatively comfortable white country and then you're dealing with like 13 year old villagers coming out of you know like what was who were from abject poverty or village life like what sort of an impression did that leave on you i think just um you know i guess i'd run off the other guys like sunny and that how they interacted and um documenting it and seeing um how they went about interacting with different cultures and have you ever heard of the search boys search, search boys no just yeah, I guess just a real, real gratitude for what we had in Australia and how we got to live and just clean yeah. water and just yeah, just all that stuff. What an impression! I mean, to to have experiences like that and then try and reintegrate into society, even as an adult, that would have been difficult. But as mm. a child, I mean, as a teenager, like uh, I can't even imagine the. Oh man, yeah. I mean, there's there's the, the, there's the impact of that, but then there's the impact of what's going on off the boat, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. kids coming out of the, the bushes and the dunes and coming out surfing the different planks and pieces of wood was mm. was incredible. Um, it was more kind of yeah, the hardcore stuff was um, on the boat, and I was the grommet and my duties and um, yeah, that side of things. You know? So you're you're on uh, boats with. Uh, I'm just trying to think back to those uh, earlier films, but. It's, Frankie O and Tom Curran, Davo. Yeah. On a Frankie O, Davo, Tom Curran, Powley. Powley? Oh, Powley was, me. Powley was the man. Wow, I mean, you've really got some <laughs> yeah. uh, go at it personalities yeah. there. Yeah, I grew up pretty quick, put it that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah my... uh, well, we, we've had Taj on talking about, you know, uh, a Quicksilver trip that he did. I think it was around about the same, 28 days. Yeah. Up there with Ross Clark Jones, Tom Carroll. There you um, go. And a couple of those boys. And. <laughs> You know, he he said it, it. It made him the man who he is. Yeah. But it was terrifying when he was there. Did you yeah. have any sort of feelings of, fuck? Oh, am I ready for this, or were you just one hundred percent? This is what I'm meant to be doing, and this is me. Like, did was, you have any insecurities, or or, or just? No, I was pretty. I was pretty point? into it. I was knocking about with Davo pretty early on, mm. so it was just like another step up with hanging out with Davo. Mm, yeah, right. It was. He you was, kind of had a big brother on the on the trips with you, right? Yeah, he was pretty um, gnarly, Davo. Um, just yeah, from like thirteen to fifteen, those couple of years, and um, so it was just like a longer trip with that. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I just dove straight into it, and um, I enjoyed it and embraced it, and I felt pretty confident as a kid and. I never really, you know, it was just, uh, it was all good. And what about your memories of the trip? Uh, I guess let's start first with just the, the waves, like any iconic sessions. I imagine there was a couple at mm. least. I just remember empty Maccas, like just come from Narrabeen <laughs> and um, just surfing macaronis, yeah. you know, just such, just a fun park. Um, we didn't know about Greenbush at that time. So that was never, there, we had a couple of really big swells, um, a really big swell at uh, Lancers. Uh, the right HT, you want to call it? I had cracked my head open and um, couldn't surf. So, um, geez, how did uh, what yeah. like, a, like not a fractured skull, just a, a split? Oh, I was pretty bad. Really? Um, 
I can't remember how many stitches I got put up here, but I couldn't surf out of the water for a bit. So it was yep. at the end of the trip, thank God. But yeah, I just remember Davo and a couple of boys getting big, big lances right. Mm. It was pretty mental. But the thing I remember the most was just probably like doing the recons with Martin. Like I think I named a break or two. I can't remember now, but just going in on the boat and the mothership, the Indies would stay out out the back and just keep on course and we'd just be going in with the tender and some tinnies and freaking Fuck, yes. fishing and just sort of come back out and yeah like just hope for the best wow. and it's a lot of trust isn't it putting your 13 year old yeah. kid in the uh care of a f- ex-salvage diver lunatic <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was just one of the Dave and Powley's about it up with it <laughs> yeah that was it just, to, just as uh role models at, at that particular time in their careers I mean Dave I just had a uh an energy, uh, a confidence, an arrogance about him that was just out of this world for a kid who was like, like you say, thirteen to fifteen. He was probably the number one surfer his age in the world. Uh, oh, absolutely, I mean, and, and, and he knew it. Yeah, he <laughs> knew it. He'd paddle out, mate, and he'd just stink eye every fucking person in the lineup. Doesn't yeah. matter who it was. Yeah, and just tear the place to fucking smithereens. I mean, that between him and Powley, like that. Once you know, it was game on. We hit the water, like we, mm. you know, we. Talk about some of the you know stuff that went on around in around the edges on the boat and whatever, but in the water, like to surf with. I mean, that same energy, that same passion, the same mongrel, all of that was what you know just drove me to get to me to be where I was. You mm. know, um, having the talent and that fire and just just not soft, like just fucking gnarly. Yeah, mm. yeah. And Curran's a different beast. You know, he's got a different yeah. energy altogether. What? How? How did he factor into that dynamic? He was kind of like still, I didn't, ha- like the Aussie guys I had a little bit more um, access to, like growing up in Louie and, and Ock and Tom and, and Duma, like I sort of had a little bit more to do with them, mm. you know, just being Aussie and sort of looking up to them and stuff, whereas Tom was a little bit further, a little bit further away. But I remember um, Greg Clough from Aloha designed some boards for Tom and um, early days he got me to bring the boards on the trip for Tom to ride. And so I, that's what kind of gave me, I had a little bit of interaction with him, just sort of opened up the, mm. the door to, to interact with Tom. And um, he's just, I just remember him being pretty elusive, a um, little bit mystical, and um, he'd just kind of pop up in the right spot at the right time, and, and then he'd disappear too. He just, <laughs> you just wouldn't see him. It'd be the b- best time, the best time of the day, and he'd just disappear for a couple of hours. Say, Where's Tom? <laughs> you know? And then that went right through onto like, you know, the Rip Curl House in Hawaii, like 15 years later, mm. he would just come in from a backdoor session and come in and turn the turkey over around Thanksgiving time. He'd come in, baste the turkey, go back out. <laughs> it's just, yeah, but always really nice to me and super welcoming. And, um, you know, when I was underage, he would let me um, borrow his hire car, for example. He'd just let me take the hire car mm. wherever we were. Like, I didn't have the license. He'd just say, take the car. And <laughs> Fuck, mate. Whatever, you know. I, I love... You know, hearing you discuss sort of the influence of these guys that you had access to and, and basically became your, your, your traveling family. Mm. Um, your guy feeds on energy. So I, I get that, you know, being around the Powleys and, and the Davos and, and that really speaks to you. But did, did you ever get words of wisdom? Did you ever have like mentors who who'd sit you down and, and give you stuff that really stuck with you? I think they probably tried, but I just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was much, just... Mate. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, my dad was probably my closest mentor and the one I listened to the most. Mm. Um, Great know, bloke, mate. Yeah, yeah. R.I.P. Greggy. Yeah, I used exactly. To love catching up with him in the car yeah, park, man. We all sure. had such good chats. Yeah, really positive bloke. Always out for the best. Love yeah. Narrabeen. Love yeah. you more than anything in, in yeah. the, on the planet, of course. And um, for sure. yeah, that's uh, it's yeah, miss mm. him a lot. He's a great bloke. Yeah, um, thanks, mate. I mean, Duma Hardman, like yeah. competitive wise, definitely helped him with some of that stuff. Um, absolutely, like through the pro juniors and even BL too, Barton. Mm. Um, they definitely mentored me through a lot of that stuff, definitely. Um, but I think just being on the search and surfing those waves and being around those guys from 13 to 18, that's kind of where my schooling came from as far as riding waves and yep. how to go about. doesn't get much better, Mate, does it? To yeah, have access to that, that, was, that was the college right you. there. It was Fuck, I was just immersed in it. and um, It's out of control. You know, making films with Sonny Miller, you'd make one 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 film a year. You know, you'd have all these destinations and something would come out at the end and so it was like premiere night. It was like, you know, like the magazines. You'd mm. ride to the news agent and wait and see, what, you know, what was going on in there and it was just so much anticipation and froth and, like, excitement and what was going to come. Yeah. And so that was a whole year of of doing the search movie, you know. So it was about, you know, fronting up and just 
having a, an epic clip and wow. doing some crazy surfing, whether it be WA over to Indo to Maldives to finish in Hawaii and wherever it's in Africa in the middle, wherever it might be, you know, so you'd shoot for a whole year mm. and you get to ride different waves and each guy would sort of take you to their special spot. You know, mm. Frankie would show you special spots in um, Africa wow. and Poncho's getting around the east side or wherever, whatever side in Hawaii and by the time, you know, collectively over a whole year, you're surfing, you know, all the different boards you're trying, all the different influences, um, far out. I mean, you, you're coming out the other side surfing a lot better. <laughs> yeah, what I'll a bet. Life. What a life. It's yeah. crazy because to mm. me, you're, you're, you know, a really contemporary surfer. You surf at such a high level now. But, you know, back in those days, surfing was so small. Like you were going to, you know, like you said, Indo had barely been discovered at this point. It's insane to think uh, that you were still in your peak able to enjoy a period of surfing where there's still fuck all people doing it mm. yeah it golden just, age really yeah for sure i mean i just yeah i can just really appreciate that it wasn't as instant instantaneous and um you know the guys had to had to swim out with their 32 shots on the film and get the, get the shot and come back in and reload and mm. you, know, you know what i'm saying it oh was, mate, um, yeah it's changed yeah. so much. I, I used such to get a, a lot of, of well, when I was running the mag smithy, um, you know, as soon as that digital era hit, mate, some of the, the old boys just were really upset mm. because it, it went from being like a, a, a one in a one percent skill set, you know what I mean? Like the, the amount the of commitment, t- skill, the crop, yeah. time you had to put into not just photography, but swimming and, you know, understanding waves. So yeah, you had to be as good as the surfers at reading the ocean. And, and I mean, guys are shooting incredible stuff now, and we know that. You know those guys still exist, but the the uh, the amount of uh, it just flooded the market, and, and it really sort of it, it pushed a lot of uh, really you know talented legendary lensmen to the brink, and a wow. lot of them quit because of it. Mm. Um, the fact that yeah, Sonny Miller, uh, R.I.P. of course, but yeah, the, these guys were the top of their game in in the last great days of surf film and surf photography i think yeah, yeah. crazy to get an insight into that period man you were just young enough to see it all mm. yeah absolutely should we get into a bit of mongrel yeah what do you got well i don't know what do you got well i got a bit we'll come <laughs> number three at number three, mate, mm. this is iconic folklore. Mm. That time he got blind and paddled a kayak Ooh. from Nemotu to cloud break, <laughs> slept in the judging tower and scored mindless cones at Sparrow Far the next morning. But this was our number one question from the Swellians too. Right? Well, we're going to do this yeah, story. A question, but everyone was straight onto it. <laughs> yeah. And I was telling Louie and um, Smithy that this is just one chapter in a, an ongoing competition unspoken competition that you and Oki and Luke had to be the first guy out every single morning right that went on pretty much your whole time on tour yeah absolutely I think Ock and Louis were when I got on there they were the the guys who were out there earliest for sure when we started absolutely you're just like fuck that <laughs> yeah we'll try and do up, up one up on the mate <laughs> So like was that that that's a true true thing that uh, you guys would like you know regardless of where the tour stopped you you were always competing against each other to get out there in the dark and and get the first waves. Yeah, I think um, well, staying with Ock and Luke a fair bit, so we just do it together, you know. But when I first got on the tour, yeah, Ock was definitely the guy doing that um, up early and and um, first in the in the lineup, you know. But sort of referring to Fiji, it was kind of like. Um, you know the two islands would have the the, the competition. You know where yeah. the, the heats and the, and the contest results and who Tavarua were, and Namotu. Yeah, and generally speaking, it's uh, mostly Aussies on Namotu and and the Americans on Tavi, right? Pretty much, yeah. That's mm. the way it used to be. Um, Scott and Mandy, the Aussies used to run it, so a lot of the Aussies would gravitate towards um, Namotu. Mm. And um, so there was already this competition of who could get out there first because it was um, back in the days of the. Um, the rights you had to stay on that island to surf there. You know, it wasn't open slather, so there's no right. public, so there's no no one out there. So it was, you're on Tavi for the contest. So it was kind of like each morning there'd be a contest between Tavaru and Namoto who could get out there first. And then obviously the contest was going on, and um, and it was my birthday the next day, and um, I'd had a heat, and um, I got knocked out, and um. Timmy Ray's got this wave down like a west one down the inside and I'd already caught a wave and better to score and there was fuck all time left and anyway he needed a, I don't know, I can't remember, but like a 6.5 or something and he came all the way back down the reef and got like a little end piece, shish kebab thing and got a 6.8, whatever, and I was blowing up. I had to be in my bonnet for the rest of the day. It was probably the score, but anyway, I was sort of dirty that he came down the inside and got mm. one and so I had a little bit of a thorn in my side towards um, 
Perry Hatchet and that the rest of the day and I sort of went back to Namotu and was trying to sort of ease the pain over a few coldies and a few extra coldies and skull drags. <laughs> yeah, you know, just, just doing what was doing on the island and then um I started thinking about my birthday the next day. Mm. And then um it started with just this thought of I want to be out there with Ock and Luke. How special would that be? You know, I think it's about my twenty fifth birthday. And um, we'd been doing that the whole event, so I thought, oh, well, that'd be fun to do, you know. And then I started thinking, as the beers were going down, I wonder if I could get out there, like, first. <laughs> you know, before, as you do. Before everyone or anyone. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and Standard mental process at yeah. uh, 10 p.m. at night after oh, a couple yeah. of beers. Maybe I can well, the, the more beers, my kayak. The more beers the- you drink, the better the idea gets. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a full-blown yeah. Einstein equation right there. Physics. It started becoming a bit better idea, and then I so I found a canoe underneath the the decking at the place, and I tried to wrangle uh, Phil Macker to come with me, and we're pretty blind. I couldn't even really sit in the canoe, so I was kind of <laughs> like, "You're not going to make it, Hog." So he gave up on me and went back up, and I think Mick and Joel come down too. We're like, "Fuck, Hog, you're not going to get out there. Just go back to bed, whatever." Yeah. And anyway, I I grabbed my six ten, and I had my leash behind me, and I set set sail. I started started working it out. Um, it's kind of like a bit of a full half half moon, so I had a little bit of light across to um restaurants. Cloud, cloud. Yeah, in the sky. yeah. No, it was um it was quite clear in my mind. Oh, mate. <laughs> this is this is what see this is the part of the story that nobody knows. We know the story, but I want to know what's going on in your brain as you're just stroking through those oily waters. Yeah, I mean, I just I just thought I'd just get across to restaurants, and I fell out a lot because they're freaking wobbly at the mm. best of times, and I'm a skin full of coldies under you. Um. <laughs> So I was just trying to like get across to restaurants and I got to the back of the white water there and then I don't know how long it took, probably about an hour or two to get across there and then um started finding my way. I started getting a little bit more technique on the on the canoe and went up the back of the reef, like had restaurants on my inside, went up and then went up the inside of um I could see the tower, kinda, mm. not really, but I sort of knew the general direction. I knew if I went up the inside it'd be okay. And there was enough tide for me to come up the inside. Um how long did it take to get across the channel? Like, how far is it? It's fucking. I don't know how far, far it is. Man. It's a long way. But I f- the thing is, like, the currents through there rip out so no. Like, even on a small day, the currents funnel through there. Like, when yeah. you're in the boat in the daylight, it's gnarly. Yeah. So do it on your own at night was just crazy. Yeah, and I when fell you fl- out heaps. Yeah, like, when fell you out. flip it. Because you, f- you jump up this side and you, you jump too far and fall out the other side. <laughs> Come the other side, back on the inside. <laughs> so it was just like... Like, like a cockatoo on a, on a power line. It's just... Oh. Woo, woo. Can they fill up and sink the, ki- the kayaks? Or sure they can. Like, <laughs> fucking yeah. hell. So uh, is there any point during this paddle where you're going, hang on a minute, this is fucking stupid? <laughs> no, I just I never doubted myself. I never, <laughs> never, never thought I was not going to make it. Uh, I just... And then, you know, I got to the tower and... Um, I um, just tied the, the canoe off at the bottom of the tower with my leggy, chucked my board up and um, got up there and just tried to have a little bit of a nap. It was about three in the morning. I left it like 10 at night and it's about three in the morning now. So it took about five hours. Sobered up a bit and um, I was up on the judges tower and there was a little like Gatorades and Powerades left mm. from the day. Perry Hatchet and that up there. So I was like, get them in. It didn't take any water. No, nah, right. No, nah, I don't need water. Nah, just nah. got me board, me boardies. Yeah. Bit thicker leggy, 6'10". Sweet. I mean, it's now my birthday, three in the morning. I try to have a little bit of a nap and um, I wake up to this boom, boom, boom. And the tides come up now. There's white water's coming underneath the tower and the leggy was stretching and it banged a hole in the front of the canoe and it took it on some water. So I went down. I was trying to like bring it back, back, back. And then it snapped and I was moving away from the tower and I bumped my head like on a coral head. And that's the first time I thought, oh, shit, hang on. I'm on my own. You just hit your head. You need to kind of decide what's going it was like mm. waterlogged and the current was going that way so i had to decide like i just let the canoe go got back to the tower and then it was sort of like pretty early on by then like maybe four thirty-five in the morning the sun comes up behind you there in the western side mm. so it was starting to get light so i went out and started surfing and it was my birthday at this point it was probably like i don't know i'd say like wouldn't say six feet it was like four to five feet mm. really nice cloud break nothing too heavy but just nice i had my 610 it felt a bit long but it was just nice Cruising out there on your own is a really surreal experience. Wow. You know, the summer's come up. It was my 25th birthday. Wow. I'm out there. It's already feels so far out when you're out there with crew mm. and, and boats and the industry. When you're out there on your own, it was just a feeling I'd never forget. It's all incredible experience. And then I just saw the corner of my eye, the first boat coming out. Yep. 
in a motu boat. Yep, yep. Yeah. Two heads, Ock and Luke. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> fuck yeah. This is shit. How good is this? And then they paddled it. It's like, what the hell? They just, I don't know what was going through their heads. You have to ask them, but I think they were just like, what the? Because they were looking on the island for me because we were staying in the one yeah. bureau and Hog's not in his bed. So they thought, oh, he might have had a few too many last night and he's crashed out somewhere. He's on mm. the island somewhere. He's mm. crashed in, around the bar or whatever. And Devo, you know, because his birthday couldn't find him. We'll go for a surf anyway and hopefully catch up with him through the day. And they come out in the boat and I'm already fucking out there. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hog's sitting that, out there yeah. already. And then my two heroes, the two guys I wanted to surf with other than probably Mick and Joel out there, but you know, they probably had heats on. Um, so yeah, surf with Ock and Luke for about probably half an hour, I'd like to say. Um, just surfing ways, just enjoying, just having a hell time. And then um, the first Tavaril boat came out with some of the guys on that boat and they were kind of had a little bit of a serious head about them and had seen my canoe um, mm. way down the channel, which had, you know, mm. capsized and no one could find me in the island. So a few alarm bells started ringing. Yeah, wow. Beep, 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 where's Hog? We found the canoe. Where is he? Bastard. Bastard. Mm. Wow. And, um, so it has shades of a kind of a, a degenerate Eddie Eichau scenario, you know, mm. like Eddie obviously yeah. sacrificed his life to save people. You just got real pissed and uh, <laughs> <laughs> nearly drowned in the channel. But... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I think it was more the point, like when you arrive on the island, you meant to sign this waiver and you meant to sort of play mm. by the rules and be a good boy and um and not play up too much. And I think um all the the liabilities and things changed then because they weren't expecting someone to paddle through the night in the canoe and mm. sort of yeah. yeah so. Oh, the fucking legal eagles, they eh? sniffed yeah. a sniffed a oh, dime. And I've I've been in the position where you think that's a good idea though. I had a a, a, a skull drag on the island the night the comp finished on the Motu. I was actually staying on Tavi, so I, I just. Got up at one point, thought, I know what I'll do. I'll just I'll just go home. This is a good and, uh, one. Oh, yeah. Fanning goes to me, <laughs> hey, uh, you're not allowed to take any boats out at night because I can't <laughs> get through the reef pass and stuff. And I just went, nah, I'm going. I'll check yeah, it later. I start walking down the beach. And next thing I know, the, the skull drags kicked in. I'm just being picked up out of the sand. I don't even remember falling over. <laughs> But I had sand on <laughs> the actual lenses of my eyes because I'd fallen face first into the sand with my eyes open. <laughs> yeah. And then they just carried me back to Julian's, Julian's room and yeah. I just spewed all over it. Oh. And then I left without paying the bar tab because I just obviously wasn't in the br- yeah, frame of mind. And, yeah. um, yeah. Fucking chief Vuni Naka. Yeah, well, uh, Joycey actually paid for that. Mm. So uh, props to you, Joycey. Thanks, brother, for, uh, yeah, first of all, yeah. let me spew all over your room. <laughs> Pick it up your bar tab. Wow. What, what a, a legend. Gent. That's iconic. But yeah, I just, I know that that frame of mind of uh you know thinking that's a good idea at the time oh yeah i mean then um rabbit was the head of the asp at the time then mm. and um so it was up to him to give me the um the talking to yes oh, talk us talk talking rabbit to. yeah rabbit, of all right? people. Yeah, yeah so i got i got <laughs> yeah yeah so this is a funny bit we go oh, around right. so i've been get back to the island and all the tavaruas um they're just sort of like a little bit bit devoed that you know uh, the motor would let this happen, you know, and um, so I had to get over to, to, to Tabarua and that's where the ASP was set up at the time and um, speak to Rabbit. Mm. So he's got me around the corner and he's sort of like, at one point he's like, oh, you know, this isn't fines and not meant to do that. And then the other, he's getting around the corner. He's like, yes, that's fucking <laughs> <laughs> Shadow boxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I love it. Out of the way, it's a fucking birthday. Fucking love oh, you, man. I love, love you, man. It. <laughs> that's the winner we need. Yeah, oh, so. Rabbit for PM. Yeah. Rabbit for PM. Yeah, so I um, God, copped a funny. fine and got sent home. And then um, I had to stay on uh, Tavarua, which wasn't a bad thing for the next couple of years until I... Oh, right. Until I behave myself. <laughs> yeah, so. But, uh, yeah, it was sort of like, I've got a little plaque up on, on um, the motu now, the crossing, the hog crossing, a few, no, few yeah, well, tails over time. there. But yeah, no, it was, it's a pretty special birthday. Yeah, won't forget it. Won't be doing it again until I've done it twice, first and last. Great yarn, mate. Yeah. Such a good one. Number two. Let's get into your world tour career, Hulk. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm so interested mm. here in this because it's a career that uh, is has some real highlights. Um, some of them coming after you'd left the tour, like the, the, yeah, the big true. tenet chopes and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I, I think uh, when I think of uh, Hoggy's CT career, obviously just, you know, fizzing, fizzing, spitzing passion is the word that mm. sort of springs to mind. Um, I just – Absolutely, more than anything, loved seeing you on big open-faced rights. As much as the big left conages were, mm. were all-time 
open faced rights, mate. Like you know, Bells, J Bay in particular, where you got a runner up finish. Um, it just the the talk off the bottom. Uh, there's a photo on the Instagram that we ran where you're just coming yeah. off the bottom and, mate, the technique and the way that you can twist your body and just fucking noon the fuck out of those things <laughs> is just so great to watch. Um, any highlights before you get it, before we go into the actual specifics there, Smivy? Uh, I mean, beating AI at Chopes in, what was that, 2004 mm. or three or something on your way mm. to a runner-up finish. Obviously, dislocated yeah. the shoulder in the final. But, yeah. uh, and I think there was a runner-up at J-Bay, like yeah. you said. Big boards, big backside hacks, fucking mm. clinical rail surfing. As good as it gets, made you proud to be a fucking Australian, but to then, be honest. Yeah, yeah. also, uh, obviously a career that I- I'd love to know from you. Is it a career that was underdone? A little bit when you look back on it because the uh <clears throat> the skill set that you had the passion that you had uh the commitment that you had as well uh was it a case of just coming up against uh, a sea of giants you know of just you know once in a lifetime t- surfers in you know the coolie kids and and parker mm. or looking back on it now do you sort of factor in other reasons for not getting those wins and, and not challenging the world title like we all thought you should have mm. Uh, I think it was the choices I was making, um, you know, obviously burning the candle at both ends, probably had, had a fair bit to play with it. Was you look at everything I was able to do in only six years on the tour, mm. when, you know, I had two finishes in the top 10, the first two years were finding my way and then we had the 9-11 bombing. So That's right. really I had three years on the tour. I made, you know, had four finals, two seconds. Um, I felt like I achieved a lot in that time and probably... Unfortunately, um, some of the choices I was making probably meant that I fell off the tour a bit earlier than what I would have liked or hoped, you know. Mm. Um, when I look back and reflect six years, I was able to do a lot, had a big impact over six years. So Big time. Yeah. Um, and knowing now, like, you know, I guess back in the day, you'd think old was early 30s. And, you know, now I'm 41. Mm. I feel like I'm, you know, a bit rusty right now after my knee surgery, but... You know, six months ago, I was probably surfing as good as I'd ever surfed at 40. So, yeah, I mean, that's that was my journey. And, um, you know, being 25, I just had a couple of years in the top 10. I uh, probably couldn't be told, you know. Mm. There's, there's definitely enough evidence and enough goings on for you sort of wake up and go, maybe some of the decisions you make are not working for you, mm. you know. I'm specifically talking about the year that I didn't qualify. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of late nights in there and a couple of performances where I just wasn't as sharp as what I'd like to be and a couple of decisions along the year that don't go your way, you lose by a point zero zero whatever. But I know within myself I wasn't quite as sharp as what I'd, I'd like to be. But, mm. you know, that was my journey and you just never know, like <clears throat> me falling off the tour um, gave me the awakening to you know to change some things in my life and mm. now i'm at 41 and i'm i'm living as i am today so maybe that's just what i needed you know let's uh just revisit the good years though yeah um when, when you're feeling it when you're on a roll and you you know you're going to get results uh yeah. and especially when you've got you know the ai's the parkos the fannies yeah. uh kelly floating around as well mm. like you must have had a couple of heats where you were just in your element, like slugging it out with the big yeah. dogs and, and really, you know, feeling like you had them. Yeah. Uh, do any spring to mind, like uh, really classics, like yeah. Smithy just brought up the AI heat well, at probably, Chopes? Probably the two that could speak of, the, you know, the, the two big boys too would be AI in Tahiti mm. and then wow. Kelly at J-Bay. I mean, Whoa. those two. <clears throat> um, firstly, with AI, um, I'd had a heat, I had the three-man heat at the start of the event. It was probably about eight foot chopes, right? I think it was that morning I did that big nally drop and um, Bruce is watching him over the, mm. over the top looking down yeah. that morning. Yeah. So we've got the heat, me and Andy, and um, I thought I was pretty deep, right? And uh, this set comes and I'm thinking oh, I'm about as deep as I want to be and, and deep. And AI just comes up around behind me last minute and comes in behind me and takes off way late, fucking way gnarlier. Just makes and gets like a nine, eight or something. Yep. I was just like, Wow. I just, just kind of blew me away. I just went, fuck, that was so gnarly. And then um, I knew from that point sort of what it was going to take to beat him. And a few few rounds kept going and then I, I had him in the quarters. And no, it wasn't six foot. It wasn't pumping. It wasn't going off. But the same intent and the desire to beat him was there. Mm. And um, we'd, had a, we'd had this situation where um, he was – we pushed each other right up the point and um, we came back – and um, he took off, I had priority and he took off really wide and didn't think I was going to take off deep. 
and remembering what had happened first the first round that's what gave me the the mungle to just take off super mm. deep and i ended up getting getting a knife in and coming in behind him and getting to where he was right and so i'm looking up the judges kind of going well that's got to be a, a drop in interference mm. and um nothing happened what nothing nothing was called nothing whatever whether they thought <laughs> look he didn't interfere up to that point or it was back in the day where if you had priority and you took off, it was kind of like a no deal. But mm. anyway, so I just surfed the heat out. That got me really angry. Nothing happened. And I ended up ended up beating him. It wasn't like a classic heat or anything, but I, I got I did the job to beat him. And then... Um, well, hang on. Before we even leave that, like there's so many photos of you and Andy arm in arm like <laughs> through your careers. Uh, what, what, yeah. what was your connection with him like? Because I think he, he yeah. obviously you two had some sort of... Uh, unspoken understanding of what drew, what drove what lived in the other the the animal that, that, <laughs> was, that was deep. Born. Yeah, and yeah, just also the the fizz, you know, like that unspoken. Just yeah, I don't want to call it anger, but there's there's yeah. something it's kind fizz. of fizz primal about it, don't you reckon? And and, and it seems like mm. he just saw that in you and just and really yeah. like connected with uh, you as a human and yeah. as a friend. Mm. Um, I would say too, it started off early. We were in OP um, World Juniors in Haleva, mm. and I'd had a wild card for whatever reason and um i ended up winning it and he wanted to fight me in the car park that day <laughs> Dave, 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 Dave he'll tell a story didn't win that he didn't want to fight someone yeah so it started early we yeah. were in about like 13 or 14 then so then i guess when i came through and we ended up being on the tour together um, how did you um sorry just to go back but yeah what do you do when uh ai and his and his crew wants to give you hiding in the car park after a contest how do you kind of maneuver Oh, like you freaking, I oh, know, I was always okay to just um, talk me way out of trouble pretty much or just, you know, just, yeah, fast runner. <laughs> 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 oh, no, I don't even know, shaping up with AI in the car park, I'll leave, there's none of that going on. <laughs> no, thanks. But, um, um, no. yeah, <laughs> uh, any other heats that you can remember from your career with with him that are particularly memorable? Um, yeah, I guess the final at J-Bay too, the, that... um. The next year, uh, he needed a 10 to beat me. He got a 10. Oh, he got a 10. So um, that's no. things. But the best, I just remember being up at Sharon's after the after party and they had the two main cocktails named after us. And, um, I can't remember what they were, but yeah, just that love in his heart after it. Like mm. once the job's done, like now he's competitor in the water, but then just so, <clears throat> so amazing on land. So just celebrate that. Um, yeah, it was, it was special, you know. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think Slater at J-Bay, he was like right at the top and he'd won the year before. Mm. It was when he was wearing those white suits and he was like on the Simons and yeah. just... That's really a magic <laughs> era of surfing in mm. Kelly's yeah, long, you know, long, so long, long, long trail of uh, epic performances. So they're, they're particularly memorable, those ones. Yeah, and I'd had just I'd, the year before I dislocated my shoulder and so I was sort of coming back into it and um, not even the year before, sorry, a um, couple months before. Um, so I had lots of fire to get back to the Rashi and had done a lot of work to get myself back there. I was feeling really good, you know, mm. and I'd beaten Parco along the way and I beat, um, Sonny. So as far as those two Fuck guys for me. a roll call on the way to the final. Yeah. Way. And, um, yeah, Slater came up and then it was just really hard to beat him. We sort of strategized that if you've got a really good wave on him to start, it's about the only way you're going to beat him if you get mm. a really good one. Mm. So I went right up the top, like up past Sharon's house. And got one past him and just linked all the way through. And I um, got a 9-3-3 first wave. Wow. And that just kind of put him on the back foot. And then he, you know, sometimes he would try a bit too hard sometimes. He'd try and like, I don't know, find barrels that weren't there. And he just, it, I never let him get like momentum and get mm. a little groove on to get his, because once he's out of the blocks firing, he can just run away. And is he getting uh, <coughs> chatty and lippy with you sort of uh, once, once you've got a big lead like that? Is he trying like pull out all the stops to unsettle you? No, once that was on, that was that was too bad for him. But prior, he was up on the boardwalk, like trying to come over. You'd have your headphones on to try to say to him, like, definitely not talking to me. I don't want you anywhere near me, kind of thing. But he'd still <laughs> try and get in front of you. Yeah, you know, he did oh. it with Mick and those guys a lot. But oh, he had a hell one with Beat at J Bay that we, mm. we heard. Uh, yeah, just so just a I Lennox just head episode for that uh, <laughs> Barb. Mm. But yeah, that's probably the two most memorable. Um, couple moments with those guys and blessed to. I mean, they smoked me a lot, but at least I can. Yeah, hang up my career boot and say that I've beat him once. Kelly beat me four times, I think. I only beat him once, mm. so at least I've beat him What about, uh, I, I always find an interesting question is, you know, who did you love to have a heat with? Who who was the person who brought out your best or brought out your mongrel? Mm. Uh, I know the top dogs always do, but was there was there someone who, uh, on the rival show, actually, Smithy, I heard Joel 
and Mick and Dean talking about it when they were on tour. As long as they beat the other two guys, they were happy yeah. with their result. Even if they got a 17th, as long as the other two got 33rds. Mm. Um, did you have someone who you just went, yes, like Nudes, for example? Was he someone you just went, oh, yes, I'm going to fucking wind you <laughs> to pieces, you string bean, you noodle limb fucking stick creature. You're gone, the hog is coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I probably, um, I loved competing with Joel the most, I think. Mm. Yeah. Part of the fact I probably had his number most. <laughs> um, let's talk about that one, eh? Um, yeah. No, I just had good heats in like at Jay Bay, at Mundaka. Um, just really good, good wave quality and great surfing. I just respected his surfing so much. Like I'd enjoy, I'd almost pretty much put his movie parts on to watch and surf, mm. like just get psyched on surfing. And I grew up with Joel surfing, so I think that's probably the closest little internal rivalry. And, like. and in the water, do you chatty? You too? I, I know that... Um, yeah. He's the kind of guy who, like, if he sees something good, he can't bottle it. You know, you hear this sort of high-pitched, oh, my God, you just hear yeah. him starting to froth out or, or get eggy that yeah. someone got a score or whatever's going on. But, um, yeah, I, I saw a heat with you guys at Mundaka and it was big and stormy. Um, dark too. They had dark. The so dark. Yeah, you had a, uh, a, just a filthy double up. Yeah, I, I, I don't know thing, if you mate. remember this. Yeah, it I was, remember, yeah. And everyone in the whole, uh, up on the in the competitors area is just watching going, low road, low yeah. road. Because if you took the high road, it was going to fully, you know, triple up and Get the bank there was just fucking unbelievable. But yeah, you low roaded yeah. it and you found the doggy. Classic hog. Classic hog. Yeah. Pit mongrel. <laughs> in and out, but uh, big dirty one. They had the comments on about nine thirty at night. Yeah, that's Joel's fantastic. excuse that he couldn't see. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's yeah. blind, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah so wow. yeah, you can barely see at the best of times. I think mm. um, that's great so, to hear, man. So, yeah, no, nah, special times. Um, that that whole era was was crazy. Good, just just the level of surfers coming through. I got a question <laughs> for you, and uh, and I'm I'm sincere when I ask this. Uh, the the Amount of partying and, and the extracurricular fun around the tour mm. in the years that you were on, I think is probably blown out when compared to the generation before yours. <laughs> um, it's just that, you know, in light of, um, I guess, everything that happened with our Andy passing, you know, it, it became something that was looked back on in a really hyper-critical, hyper-sensitive way. But the, the generations beforehand, I, I think would have, this is from my knowledge of it, would have, basically wipe the floor in terms of having good times. Mm, um, yeah. how, how real was it and how, um, you know, how debilitating or how affecting was it on, on your, your, your guys' career, with your career in particular, but, you know, uh, the guys around you who aren't those sort of top ten, you know, if you're mm. talking about sort of talented surfers who make it on tour and they're not getting through the draw as much as they'd want to and, and they're turning to, you know, turning it into fun. Yeah. Uh, how damaging is that to, to people if they're I not think, ready for it? I think you're, um, you know, you already got, you got a transition as it is, you know, from being someone and incentives and, and living this life where it's just such a roller coaster. Um, existence, you've got such high highs and lows, you're off to the next place and you're part of this tour. And then, so when you come off of that, um, that's already enough to deal with. So if you've got to deal with the other stuff that goes on too, and you've been coping with those emotions and the roller coaster through, whatever you're trying to substance or whatever you're trying but to what are we up. talking about here hog are we talking i know that every single every single place you go to it's that it's that place's time to party right so so it's a it's a non-stop party circuit but yeah. are the, in your time was it a case of like every single night you're out every yeah. single night you you're drinking heaps of piss woofing mm. up doing whatever it is that yeah. was going down or is it not that full-on is it like you you surfing your heats and you, you let go at the end of the week or I'm just curious to know because yeah. it's, it's such a hard thing to get a read on, you know, the reality compared to how it gets sold. Well, I mean, we'll start with it was the Foster's World Tour. Yeah. Okay. So there was the Foster's World Tour. So every comp site's just... At the time, there's free piss free everywhere, right? Yeah. And then you've got the opening night to welcome the athletes to town. And um, so it's like you were saying, Vaughn, it's, it's that town's week to shine, mm. you know, so it's like an endless summer. So you start the event with, with a party, yeah. you know, um, and obviously people from the town are excited to have the names in town. So they want to show them a good time. So everything's getting thrown at you. This, this entry, that entry, try this, try that, go, go to this place. We want to see you here, whatever. Mm. Um, stoked to have you there. And then, you know, whether you get knocked out early or you keep going, 
you know, there's always someone from the first round that's ready to go out to the bar and drink mm. with because it's happened on the first day, right? You lose you know, round two, whatever you're losing, guys. Mm. So from early on that week, there's people starting to join the, the festivities. So um, I think, you know, it can start pretty early on, on the, in the event. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, whether you do shit or whether you went well, it was kind of always a good time to, to enjoy the town and to, to party. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Does it, is it a hard thing to separate yourself from or does it really get a grip on, you know, certain people? I think it's um, it's a hard thing to separate yourself from. It just depends on your personality and everyone's different, you know. Like I think for me personally, speaking from my experience, mm. uh, just my timing around it kind of sucked. Like there was guys that would go really hard. Like say Mick, you know, we'd he'd get as pissed as all of us and have a hell time. Eugene would come out but then his timing, he would know when to stop and yeah. – It'd be after a contest win or the, uh, his timing was really good, you know, whereas I'd get a little bit jaded and kind of would carry on into the next week or onto the flight going to the next place or, do you know what I mean? So I didn't quite have a grip on it um, in that regard. Mm. So for me, it was more of a timing thing. And It's, when a, you, it's one of the, one of the, the uh, I've, heard, I've read about this and, and uh, heard about it firsthand from a, a few mates who are, you know, top of their sport athletes. And they were saying that they knew how to party and they could party with the best of them. But mm. Monday morning, they'd go to the gym and they'd train all of it out of their system for the next week. Mm. So it wasn't like just this constant, uh, oh, yeah, I'm not really feeling that good today. I might just go out tonight because this party's on. Yeah. It's like, nah, it's just there's the full stop mm. and I've got a, I've got a job to yeah. do. And then when, once that job was done, whether it was done early or, or done late, they could they, – they, they just had the on and off switch. Yeah, the Ben Cousins regime, which was, uh, you know – Bend to the recovery session on yeah. Monday, and then just run laps until you spew them up. Yeah, exactly. Just run, run. Yeah, the which is not the a healthy right way to you. live. And obviously, Ben Cousins isn't a prime example of a life, you know, that uh, has some sense of self control over it. Mm. Well, you won a few premierships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah but, but, I mean, it's it's a it's a burn it's a burn hard and burn out. Oh yeah, lifestyle. Um, yeah, I mean, I I was super focused and. Um, I was like the first there and last to leave was my motto. And, you know, it wasn't all messy and bad times, sort of, you know, painting a picture like that. It was super focused. And, um, you know, while I was still in the event, I found it a lot easier, I won't lie to you. Like mm. once I got knocked out, it was harder for me to stay on track and think, oh, okay, you've got an event next week. That's right. where I struggled. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So if I was to do well and keep going, it, it definitely helped me through the week. Um, there's no one more focused and psyched and um, dedicated while I was still in the event, like mm. up early and all the boards dialed and surfing and putting everything into it. Um, it's just that when I got knocked out, I felt that that loss and that that angst of not being in it anymore. Mm. It just hurt me so much. I needed something to fix that. Mm. So I looked for something outside of myself to fix that. It was the competitor in me. It was just like, fuck, I can't handle this. I want to be in it. Wow. That, that yeah. was the hard bit for me. Gotcha. You know? So like going to Tahiti and like I'd be up before anyone. I'd be out there trying all my boards, like just super focused, you know. And I think that's what, when you're going through your mid-20s, you know, you can get away with so much, your, your body and your mental state. Um, you can just bounce back pretty easy. I think for me it became a problem when I probably knew within myself that I wasn't making the best choices and I told myself I won't do that again and then I did it. So mentally I started... You start tearing yourself down yes. with uh, shame, yeah, pain, that, that stuff, disappointment you know? and uh, yeah. Yeah, your self-esteem takes a hit and your performance can't just can't live up to anything when you hate yourself. Start thinking, yeah. um, you know, if you've done the work, you, you deserve, you feel like you deserve the win and the waves are going to come to you and all that really good stuff. Whereas mm. if you haven't done the work, you start questioning mm. a few things and, and mm. your judgment, you start maybe picking the shit wave because you're, you're panicked or um, just making irrational decisions rather than being it's super calm. just changed so much, man. Yeah. I mean, you go to a contest now, you you will <coughs> be lucky to spot a, a top surfer, whether it's at a, at a, a pre you know, a launch party. Yeah. Uh, even the after parties, you don't see them at. Mm. They, they just they they they're so on their own programs, yeah. and they know what they have to do to even stay on tour. Mm. I mean, um, like you say, um, you know, in your the early days of your career, you can get away with a lot. Yeah. But I don't think you can now. There's just too much froth. Uh, yeah. those, those elite surfers are just they'll yeah. just rinse you if mm. you've got a weakness. Number two. All right, uh, number two in the life and times, the hog from the rock and roll lifestyle to plain old rock bottom, mate. Like, uh, when did you know it was time to, you know, get a bit of help? Mm. 
2006, 2007, um, went into my first rehab joint in Sydney. I would kind of fell off the tour and then um, just heard that, you know, if you do this 28-day program and sort of get your life back on track and, you know, a couple of my family members had said there's places you can go to get help, you know, and, and um, so, yeah, it's like 2006, 2007. But the problem for me was that I went and did that and then uh, I went back on the tour. I got over to Scotland and um, I won the prime. And but I was, yeah, but I was I was drinking during that event. So did you get the like, sword? I got the sword. Oh, you're joking. They got the sword. So I did was kind of like, just hunt out Russell Winter for a fucking <laughs> exactly. mid street battle outside of <laughs> yeah. <fucking life. laughs> outside the pub. Exactly. So I kind of like, yeah, I just thought I was going to get straight back on the tour. I hadn't quite got the hadn't totally surrendered to what I needed to do for me, mm. you know. So I was sort of still dibbling and dabbling a bit, and having won the prime, whilst you know drinking i sort of thought oh well i'll be i'll be back on tour and it'll be sweet but i didn't get another result for that year so kind of 2008 and 9 i was still you know making the choices that weren't really serving me too well and then uh 2011 i went just waved white flag again and went look i need to do i'm gonna do whatever it takes Mm. um i totally surrender my thinking my best thinking got me to where i am and obviously it's not working i just need to be told or listen did did you have people you know, it's tapping you on the shoulder or, or was this just a, a, a realisation that you came to on your own where you were just like, nah, this is... Uh, it came from me. You know, I had yeah. enough people trying to tell me and I think unless you want it, it's like anything, if you don't want enough yourself, you've got, got Buckley's, you know, mm. until you're totally 100% committed and totally surrendered. Um, you just won't listen if, if you're not in that headspace. No, nah, I, I kind of yeah. did it like when my dad passed away. I was like, I knew for dad, like he'd he'd want me to be living my best life and be making good choices and, and you know, his love for me, I kind of used that as a big inspiration when he passed away and I swear that got me through to about 18 months mm. with the sobriety and I felt really good and then I kind of just started back sort of thought I could maybe control drink and you know just sort of do it on my terms but sooner or later it got back to where it was pretty mm. quickly so I found out through that experience I can't do it for someone else I have to do this for me mm. as much as you know I do this for dad and it, it definitely got me a foundation yeah I needed to do this for me and it wasn't about sponsorship, get back on tour or anything. I mean, I was on the bones of my ass. It was about getting, learning to live life without, um, on a daily basis without having to put something in me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like, you know, I was, I was in a, I was in a hole. I was in a shit spot. What are the keys to your recovery? Like, uh, you know, h- how do you manage those, those rough patches of the day or the week without booze when you've been so used to medicating yourself, I guess? Mate, it's like learning how to live again. It's just, it's a tricky thing. I lost heaps of mates that I guess weren't really mates. And it's, um, I guess like anything, my passion when I'm doing something, I'm doing it. So it's just about being mindful of what I'm putting in and having a balance. And, you know, it just turns into fitness and probably get a bit obsessive in some other areas. But, um, you know, as long as I get my head on the pillow each night with not, not picking up a drink or a drug, I'm doing all right. <laughs> I still make shit mistakes and have shockers, but it's not because I'm off my head. So... It's just one day at a time, you know, not looking too far ahead. If I think I can't drink again forever, it's too overwhelming. Mm. It's too, oh, shit, that's scary. If I don't drink just for today, I, oh, I can probably do that. Mm. Maybe Some days it was just for the next hour. Mm. Some days it was the next 10 minutes. Wow. Just make the next right choice for the next 10 minutes. Mm. That's, all, that's all I could look at. Wow. The hour, hour by hour. And then having a, having a bit of routine too because I think as a surfer, uh, my whole life I've never had to – the accountability hasn't really been there. When you're a young kid, as we spoken earlier, getting paid to surf from 13, going on boat trips, um, having a paycheck from Rip Curl, coming in no matter what training I did. I mean, it was all about results, mm. but I was still getting paid, you know, so it was like didn't quite have that grasp on bang for buck um, what that looked like. So my the reality on earning money and how you earn money was really skewed, you know. So um, it was just about... I guess doing it for me and um, for no one else it wasn't about Rip Curl. It wasn't about getting back on the tour. It mm. wasn't for anything. Mm. It was just okay, me and um, get my life back on track. So yeah, it's probably the best thing I've done. You know, is yeah, real life changing experience for sure. Yeah, yeah. Six, so that's ah. the most proudest achievement, eh? One of yeah. Well, you know, it's flowed on to all the good things in my life now. Mm. And no, I didn't get back on the tour, but. You know, it's shown Never through. say never, mate. This, this, this You're whole looking new sharp series. Of, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're just... I guess, you know... It, it'll come to you. That's 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 what'll happen. You watch. You, especially at this age, it's all... You just put the the pieces of the puzzle down and, and they'll eventually sort of start falling together. Whatever it looks like, mm. 
whether it's getting back on tour or, or having a comp win or just representing Narrabeen in those border riders battles yeah. to the full potential. Every single time you give those things a shot, mm. there's nothing in the way. That's it, you know, just wake up fresh and everything's a chance. As long as I just had to work out, like, there's one thing that I can't do and that's drink and drug. That career sucked, mm -hmm. but I can do everything else and anything I put my hand to, um, I'm a chance and I can do better without that in my life. So, Bravo, mate. You know, the, um, the Connets win for me is that I can, you know, be a dad to my daughter. It's, yeah. That's 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 the world title. It's because, you know, if I say I'm going to be there at nine, I'm there for her, you know, and she can trust me and I don't think that would be happening if... Um, if I was still making the old choices, so yeah, that's no, good stuff. Mm -mm. Fucking oath, mate. Congrats, so proud brother. Of you. Massive. Number one. Um, all right, number one in the life and times of Nathan Hog Hedge, from maniac pisshead to peace-loving family man, the resurrection ah. of the hog is complete. <laughs> <laughs> we have the question a little bit back to front. You can cut the other ones in there. Oh, <laughs> mate, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I guess we just sort of covered that. But, yeah. But the the I just I want to talk about one event in particular, Smithy. If I may drop in here, Mate, is there anything there that you wanted to, to dive no, in? No, no, we've touched we've, on we, most yeah, of we it. got on that. So number points, one, but... the resurrection. Mm. But the, for me, there was a, a clear view of of uh, you know a more mature you, a guy who owned himself at, at that Tahiti comp, the the, yeah. the big one. Um, yeah. It was probably the most famous big wave event of all time. Uh, that's the one with. Uh, Gabby and Kelly in the final. Yeah, the epic uh, oh, John, John, John. John, maybe. Uh, sorry, Gabby. Gabby, Kelly, and Kelly and uh, John, John surfed the the, the, the heat of a, of the century oh, yeah, yeah. in the semis, and yeah. then Gabby ended up taking the win. Gotcha. But I mean, from start to finish, that event is just yeah. more iconic than than just about anything. And you were thick and deep in the draw, yeah. and uh, a memorable ten, mate. A yeah. memorable ten, but also mm. the passion. It almost cost you. Yeah. It did cost you, right? Yeah. Because you, you, Gabby just <laughs> watched you having the time of your life, flying out in the channel, just redeemed and just snuck up your inside like the uh, the little competitive earworm that he is. Yeah, I think looking back on that, um, it was a rising swell that day. So the mm. waves that were coming in to me looked like good waves. And I mean, early, early on, he went so far up the point that I said, look, I'm not going to get engaged in this. I'm just going to surf me and Chopu like, come back i had my best performances when i just celebrated me connecting with the wave but you're a man on a mission at that event too right oh that, yeah that absolutely. was through the trials and and the whole thing through the trials boom first round um all that whole deal and then um yeah we'd had like a week off and this swell was rising and so the sets started coming in and so they were still good size waves i mean the first wave i took off on i got a nine two three which is not a shabby score no but <laughs> no it's all right wave, when it's uh, it's yeah. West Bowl, just absolute yeah. fucking Niagara Falls on the inside. But the one behind was bigger um, and smoother and more groomed and just a bit thicker. So Gabby kind of, he kept on getting the second wave in the mm. set. So yeah, tactically, he just played the most perfect game where I kind of just wanted to get on the front foot and um, put some pressure on him. Mm. Um, being the wild card and he would know that I got the 10 early in the event. So I thought if I can do that to him, he might start to panic a bit. And I knew my connection with the wave and I'd spent, I'd had heaps more barrels out there than him. So I backed myself, you know, um, but yeah, he just, he didn't put a toe wrong, didn't make one wrong decision that whole event. So to his credit, he just, yeah, blew everyone away. Mm. How does that wave rate though in, uh, you know, in the, in terms of your entire career? Because the, the, the classic shot of you, you know, like it's in the channel, it's not even in the, in the cone zone. <laughs> yeah. It's just like staring up at the sky, mm. like we said, veins exploding. And um, mm. it's just such a beautiful moment, man. It, it really yeah. does feel like you could not be more just on top of exactly where you wanted to be, like just exactly yeah. in that moment. Well, that was, you know, as we'd spoken previously, that was from going from a year in rehab, sitting on the bones of my ass, not knowing if I was even going to get back to surfing or how mm. I was going to just on a day-to-day -day basis. So to be back in that environment, surfing that wave in that moment, getting a perfect 10 was just like, that was that passion all coming through. There's a celebration of all that hard work and um, just that all collectively coming together. That was that was what that was about, you know. Um, Fucking just man. crazy. It was just <laughs> like a total. 
It's just it's sort of hard to put in words. Yeah, it's, it's just, just like just nuts, if you um, want to script up a movie, that's that's your last scene. Yeah, that's, that's like <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just going to make everyone cry, and uh, <laughs> you know you're just going to be sitting there hugging your mates, high fiving. You're yeah. just going to be losing it because there's just, everyone you, in the cinema just chanting hog, 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 <laughs> hog, hog. And I mean, there was there was nothing yeah. handed to me, like to do and say, I oh, just get back to the trials and stuff. It wasn't like Rip Curl or someone paid for me to go. Nah. Over there. I'm talking like I borrowed. 2500 off my auntie wow to go over i stay with a family over there like use some frequent fire points that i think my uncle had like i'm not talking wow. nothing was handed do you know That's what i mean incredible. then you've got to get through trials with like bruce and freaking um <laughs> anthony walsh bruno and, and, and then the bruno of the local and, um, guys and oh can't remember the names right now but the drill a brothers yeah you know Manoa um, and uh here at the time was nuts too yeah um to a motu so but, many good. Uh, so like, the trials is just its the own. The trials are so yeah. gnarly. Um, Jamie O'Brien. What? Yeah, like all wow. those guys were in the but trials. Even, I think we so, might have spoken for Surfing World before you went over. I think, I think you came did, into the yeah. office one day and you were going, I'm going, I'm going. Yeah, and we're like, yeah. Mate, it was yeah. just like, it was like staring at your head when you were 14 <laughs> and you, you just, yeah. like, just had it. You had that look, mate. And I just, what was it like, you know, just the, you know, getting over there on your own ticket and just, being around the surfers and the, and the energy mm. of it, because everyone like oh. you know, it's when it's big and the and the and the earth is shaking when the sets hit. Yeah. Um, everyone's walking around. It's not as cruisy as yeah. it normally is. Everyone's got that kind of like bug eyed, like what are you riding? What are you doing? Yeah, it's a bit. Well, you get the pats on the back, like oh, good to see you, Hoggy. What yeah, are you riding, yeah. mate? Like what's going? On? <laughs> How was the energy for for you just to get straight back into it, mm. be amongst these this new generation of um, world champions by yeah. that stage? Uh, Gabby on the way to his first. Was it a different ball game? Did it feel like a completely different world, or, or was it just mm. like, okay, yeah, I know this, I know this zone. I'm going to paddle out and give yeah. give these guys some. I guess I was coming into it having known what I'd been through, and having you know not been on the tour for that much time, mm. and having a bit of a bee in my bonnet that I felt like I could have stayed there, and I probably should have. But mm. being okay, my own skin, knowing who I am now, and being having accepted, I know who I am, and now I've got an opportunity. So I had that energy coming into it. So I don't think anyone wanted it more than me. I can honestly say that. Maybe there was, but I, I didn't feel like there was. I was like, I was there and I deserved to be there. And, you know, I had dislocated my shoulder in the final, you know, when I was on the tour. Unfinished like, business Yeah, too, so I was yeah. like, you know what, this is, I've got some unfinished business. I know this wave. I connect with this wave. I love this wave. And, um, you know, that's what I was kind of, and having the practice heats through the trials got so much confidence mm. because by the time you start in round one, I've had like seven heats with probably the best guys. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, I'm already riding on a high note. All my boards have been in, in the country for three weeks or whatever. So I was feeling really good in myself. And then I guess getting up early in the dark and going out there, paddling out to the, the green buoy and, and tying a board off at the channel and having that moment, what that gave me by the time the contest started was over and above anything else I could describe because you're out there on your own and having not have, like, water security or people around, it really... um it gives you this extra confidence and um, puts you in a spot with the wave where you really do need to connect and there's no one there's going to save you basically that time of the morning. So by the time, you know, the sun's out and you've got water security and all that, it feels like a bit more of a breeze, mm. you know. Um, but, yeah, it's fucking scary when there's swells rising and you're sitting in the channel and you know you're the next heat and there's quite a few times where the person in the heat before me got injured and was mm. off to off the hospital and they're still oh. running the kind it's not like put on hold or nothing nah. still going so <laughs> no i saw that they've, they've they stopped an nrl game the other night because a guy had a cramp mm. <laughs> I was like, come <laughs> yeah, on yeah. mate it's concerning the toes back yeah um, they're hectic. <laughs> yeah so being in the channel and um with the rising swell when you've got the whole sporting world watching mm. you know internet wise and you got all your peers and everyone who you respect and who you want to do well in front of right there there's nowhere to hide you know, if you got priority, I mean, you were sitting there and the set comes and I've got priority, you're either going to get exposed or you're going to have to go. Wow. <laughs> so, you know. No it's, thanks. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of those things. So it's kind of right. like there's, there's nowhere to hide out there. And I think, um, but, you know, just I just brought it back to celebrating the wave and, and you know, you get either your best wave or your worst wipeout. And so mm. you just take your chances on that. Um, yeah. Well, talk us through the 10. I mean, before we let you go, because it's you just beat the guillotine. Like, it's a heroic yeah. gonads in the throat drop. And, uh, yeah, it's just – it's fucking out of control. It looks like you could have died in that thing. 
yeah, I think just the lead up to it, um, again, it was an Arvo heat and the wind had gone a little bit onshore. So it was, I knew the bigger, thicker ones would cup out and mm. hollow out because once they hit the reef, they're just too thick. They go hollow. And um, I was in a heat with Adriano D'Souza and he already had a six and um, sort of starting to build a heat. And I hadn't had fuck all yet. So I was starting to sort of, you know, the heat was going on. It was a bit onshore. It was picking up. And um, a couple of big waves came through and I didn't go them. And I sort of felt within myself like maybe I could have gone them. And I've yelled across to my brother and Matty Graham and Charlie, you reckon I could have made that one? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, fuck. And I splash oh, the water. And I'm like, oh, oh, no, oh, so you know, Dave, Yeah, good on <laughs> you, boy. Yeah, you come over mate. here and have a go, you <laughs> mongrel. Come on. <laughs> they're like, yeah, you could have made it. So I'm like, okay, fuck. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, I was just said to myself at that moment, because D'Souza had a six and the heat was almost halfway through. Mm. And after the boys give me a bit of stick, I was like, right, the next thing that, the next thing that comes, I'm fuck, I'm, I'm going. You know, so that that thing came, yeah, and it didn't really look like a very nice wave. It was not the sort of wave I would have picked in a free surf. Put it that way. Mm, bit of but, foam in it too. Yeah, a bit of foam. But I sort of knew, like, from surfing out there enough, like in the Arvo, seeing some of the guys, the waves they got, how they just cup out and go clean. I knew I wanted a big, thick one, and having not gone those couple of waves was enough for me to give that extra little bit that I needed. So yeah, I just kind of just put my head down and went for it, and um. I just I've done a lot of work on those boards too. I trusted that design and with the quad and Are these are Xanadus. The Xanadus, yeah, the Xanadus. He was um real shaping centric. sexiest man. Yeah, Xana nudes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Xana nudes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it wasn't it wasn't that long, but it had the thickness. Right. What a what a what a run! <laughs> what an event for you! Yeah. It, was a, it was a full rebirth of the hog, and uh, you know it's been nothing mm-hmm. but uh, good things since in terms of just you know what your reconnection with surfing. Like you know yeah. you're just clearly in the zone and loving it, and it's awesome to see. Ask us a question, we'll tell you no lie. Ask us a question, we'll tell you no lie. We're going to throw it to the Swillians now because uh, you, you've got Swillians. a few, but I'm just looking. It's not just the fact that you've got a heap of questions here. Have, have a go at the calibre of the people asking here. We've got Harry Bryant. He wanted to know about the uh, Namotu to Cloudy story, so you've covered that. Thanks, yeah, Haz. Sheldon Hazza. Simkus, he's just frothing out on your surf shots, uh, mate. Shelly. He's uh, an absolute legend. Got some fucking huge monstro conage up there at the uh, secret spot off. I some won't sort even of say tube off hound. Where. He's a mad dog, mate. Isn't he? TVC, of course. Oh, Wherever the hog is, that. you'll see TVC yes. sniffing around the edges. Exactly. Looking for the froth on your you, Tom. What do you reckon? Uh, Hendo from the Woozle. He uh, also wanted to know about the Namodu to Cloudy's mm. Holly Warren team Mac. That's Dave Mac and the family. Nice. Mate, so many crew. Uh, but this one, Jacob Fryer, this is a good question. Mm. Is it true that when you were living in Jeringong, you paddled out to second Bommy Jaroa when it was maxing? Or are these just village whispers? True. True story. True. I did How have someone with me. Oh, it's fucking far. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, I, I, Namoto to Cloudy Far or not quite that far, nah. but it's far. But at least it was daylight. Oh, okay, so that's good. good. Yeah, 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 that's good. Mate. And I had Matty Granger with me. Yeah, we we're on nine and ten foot boards, so yeah. But yeah, it's a long way out. It's normally only like jet ski and stuff. But um, yeah, it's this, this freaking thing out in the middle that uh breaks rarely, and it was no wind. So yeah, we we paddled across there on normal boards. Yeah, wow. Nine foot boards. Yeah, we got to across there. Quick one from Jimmy Nedwich. Fit as fuck hog. What's Oof. the program he wants to know? Um, Just healthy, clean foods, mate. And I'm just always on the go. You know, I'm, I'm into the high performance centre. Not the go they day. sell at the Howie Moe, though. Not that go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, Not the go, go. <laughs> um, just, yeah, I guess it just goes hand in hand, making better choices. It sort of flows, you know. I'm more inclined to make better choices for myself. Um these days so it's just yeah i'm not crazy in the gym i don't have anything too too routine but i definitely look after myself and um yeah i'm, I'm into the gym with the boys mondays and wednesdays and other than that it's lots of yoga and just surf fit mostly mm. you know if i'm surfing a lot i'm feeling good you're on the way to the desi hasler uh, body weight program i heard he, he just got rid of all <laughs> the heavy shit out of the gym yeah. and everyone just had and just put up a few ropes yeah right you just got to use your own body weight yeah. as, as your uh uh, Johnny Gannon's been in my corner doing some foundation training and some, you know, lots of breath work and oh, stuff yeah, like talk that. Us, yeah, talk to us about that foundation training. It's a pretty mm. uh, new 
Well, it's just, yeah, it, it's been good for me to come back from injury because you, you sort of hold your poses, it's static, and, um, you know, you start to tremble. You're not actually moving. Mm. It's not so much cardio, but it's just a real core strength-based you just feel really, you get really strong from doing that. Core yeah. strength, yeah. core Lord Vaughan. Yeah, yeah the yeah. knee trembler has taken on a whole different meaning now compared mm. to when I was in high school. Mm. Yeah, but anyway. You got a <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, no, I didn't, thank goodness. Uh, Hambo Estrada, famous uh, New Zealand photographer and uh, a handy surfer himself. He wants to know your best Davo story. Oh, you, best Davo story. Where? Righto, righto. Did he go on off the yeah, top of your yeah, head? Yeah, absolutely. Hell, how about you stick one out of that? One more episode for this. Righto. <laughs> Endless um, library of Davo. Uh, okay, so Connors is a bit small at Bell, so they moved the Connors down to Joanna. Mm. And Davo's got his uh, Maroon Holden Commodore. Got barely any boards. Doesn't turn up with any boards. Sponsored by Aloha, but didn't break, take any boards down there, <laughs> whatever. So turns up to Bell's. I remember, you know, hanging out with him and staying with him and stuff. And um, we get down to Joanna. And he so happens he's in a heat with Kelly Slater. Mm. And um, 94, right? So this is Kelly in absolute Hollywood prime. Still yeah, has Dave a head full of hair, the whole thing. Oh, yeah, the, whole, the full deal. Mm. So uh, Jimmy Slade, Baywatch days kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think I got invited to come down Rip Curl just to sort of stay and be around the event. Um, Dave got a wild card. And, um, yeah, he's got this titchy surfboard. Remember a little squ- rounded square tail? And um, never surfed before. No tail pad. I had to give him the wax. And there's this little right rip bowl going through, and he's just like, oh, I reckon I'm going to ride this board. He's just a froth on riding brand new boards, um, unridden. He just liked the challenge. He mm. liked. He, Davo could pick up a board and just put on his arm. He'd know yeah. how it was going to go. Yeah, and you're that, up against Slater in '94. You yeah. need another challenge. Don't you? <laughs> yeah, like that. That just blew me away yeah. that he could do that. You got Slater in the heat. Um, yeah, you're just going to ride a board you've and never he ridden. He walked down with like a Waimo Bay leash too, didn't he? He had some no, mega it was, it was leg no rack. leash. Yeah, no. Leash. <laughs> well, that's right. Nudes wouldn't let him take it. Yeah, no. Leash. But that's the story oh, is that, that Nudes tells. Okay, he yeah, goes right. like, "No way, he's you're, you're not out using that." that. No. Yeah, yeah. And um, anyway, the the uh, the warm up in the car park um, was an interesting warm up. Mm. Um, it was a warm up. And uh, so, yeah, I've just seen Davo pick up this brand new board. Are we talking like uh, warming up the, the head, warming up the lungs, warming up the... Warming up the lungs, <laughs> getting, <laughs> getting the head, 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 head a bit of, bit of breathing. Okay, so yeah, we're talking bit of Tommy Rodonicus or Cheech and Chong here. <laughs> I think we're <laughs> headed more towards uh, Cheech and Chong. From yeah. A little from Colin B. There's different, different um, pre-heat preps and Davo's on was, uh, was a unique recipe. <laughs> Bit mm. of breath work. Yeah, a bit of breath work. Mm. So anyway, he's gone down there, no leash, brand new board, <laughs> prep, paddled out late, I believe, and just gone out there and just I just watched him um, you know, annihilate Slater on this little right rip bolt as ah Dave just alley tail rights, out. Wasn't it? Yeah, just just alley rights and just come in and just like just too easy. It just blew me away. It's, it's fa- just classic Davo. So famous. Wow. That's you know, Kelly Slater's first ever uh, first round loss. With Davo, yeah. Uh, that was against Davo. This is uh Whacked out wild card and, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. on a board and never ridden. And, oh. and that night, Kelly uh, ended up sleeping in the tracks house. So Matt George was staying with us and right. uh, he he got maggot. Kelly got blind. He had to let off steam. And yeah, he's right. pro- you've seen he's seen just been destroyed by Davo. I'm, yeah. He's probably taken a leaf out of his notebook. But right? uh, someone mentioned in the in the morning at uh, Matt George actually said to us, you know, oh Kelly's like yeah, he's asleep in the back room. He's a uh, He's uh, still still out. And I said to Ridgeway, mate, we've got to shave his eyebrows. We've got to. <laughs> and uh, Ridgeway wouldn't let me. He's like, no, nah, you can't disre- disrespect the champ. Yeah. And now he always says to me, fuck, I just wish I'd let you. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I'd one let chance. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a great uh, yeah, yard, That's a good mate. Davos too. I've got that's plenty more. Yeah. Oh, you, I reckon well, that might even just have to get you and Davo together for a, a, that'd a special be, that'd be classic. A special throw down there if we can. Narrowing Surf Club there, live show. Can Imagine that. that. Amazing. So he's a good storyteller. And, um, you oh, know, when, when he's good, story. when he when he's, he's on a best. roll, he's probably one of the yeah. most charismatic, yeah, incredible humans yeah. ever. Yeah, he's got a good heart, Davo. It goes the other way as well, though. Uh, all right, Brendan Howitt. Uh, again, just wants to know about uh, knifing that Chopes bomb. So we've covered that. Mm. Um what about, I've got one from oh, uh, go Jack, Jackson McIntyre. He wants to know, is Warrywood Hogs Breath Cafe where you lost your virginity in the 90s? I don't know. What? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I can report that's not the, that was not the spot. <laughs> um, Narrabeen Island, just across from Woolworths there is uh, the spot. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Ikaboo Island. Yeah. Love that joint. They paddle, call that. Paddle your dad's mouth across. Didn't they call uh, that Sock Island for a while or Andy's Island? Because that's I where... <laughs> 
I heard that's where all the grommets went to uh, rub it out over there. <laughs> oh, no, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, in, Co- in Cortasia says here that uh, they surfed lowers at Winky Pop with you once and went one for ones and that you gave up some of the better ones, top bloke. So just a, a thre- sh- shout out there. Mm. And then another uh, shared session from Stratus Goods Co. says uh, you won the 2000 lowers QS. Yes. Um, and he says that he paddled up to you and said, man, I haven't seen much coverage of you lately and I thought you'd stop competing and you said, nah, mate, I'm back. <laughs> and we both had a laugh and then Hedge paddled in and uh, that was the big QS and he just uh, wanted to know whether that was the catalyst for finally making the tour. Yeah, that year um, in that event to having a win, um, I think Andy was in the final, Shay and Kalo and Dino's dad, Dino and Dino. Wow, that's yeah, a fucking yeah, bridge over some generations. Yeah, so he was probably at the end of his career then, but it's still there and mm. haven't been lowers. Um, but yeah, collectively, that was my first big win for that year. And then I went on to Europe and got a um, two other finals in France and um, in England. So yeah, definitely that was the year. Um, me and Mick were travelling together and um, I think me winning that first one kind of really sort of inspired him too. And then the next year he was on the tour as well and... Yeah, it was it was a you know, first big QS win, especially at Trestles. Mm. Um, we were, we were driving. Crammy used to um, look after Rip Curl then too, and Crammy gave us a big suburban, which was rolling around this black suburban around Cali. Got the Conest win. Yeah, it was sick. Nice, <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Quick one from Liam Carroll. Best goofy foot ever on the northern beaches. Mm. Who wants to know who was? Oh, um, oh, geez, that's a big question. Mm. It's a fucking fair few of them. Mm. Yeah, there was lots. I mean. <coughs> Tommy, Tommy TBC Little Tommy Tommy It's got to be BL Two times D- BL Duma 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 I mean there's Yeah oh, Even the Kite yeah. Joel Joel Fitz Mate he, uh, yeah. He's He's Joel Fitz Fucking uh, unbelievable Yeah From one inch to 200 foot He's yeah. He's a standout every time Barrel riding too He's just Mad yeah, dog Joel Fitz Cole Smith and those guys What about those early Narrabeen guys mate You caught much of them Oh, I definitely looked up to them and got to see a lot of their surfing, but uh, didn't hang out with them too much. Nah, mm. we're still still a little bit young at that time. Yeah. All right, couple more here, Smith. Uh, Dylan Moffat just says, "Fuck it, woof, go the hog." Yeah, Moffy. Uh, lots of love for you here, mate. People, obviously, you know, connecting with your passion and uh, some of the great moments that you've shared over the years. One guy just wrote, "Feral Kingdom, discuss." <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Chocolate barrels, you were on some epic surf trips, mate. Yeah, we'd had the freaking El Nino happen up in Peru and um, we got flooded in and sleeping on the Pan American Highway under the freaking truck. Cause no, no, the road had, you know, caved mm. away and, um, yeah, we just, it was just nuts times. Yeah, just, oh. just raw. Uh, what about this one? Uh, this is from uh, Sieves108. Uh, as a fucking mad dog with unlimited mongrel, who was the most <laughs> aggressive and unyielding competitor you ever faced in a heat? <clears throat> oh. We talked about some of your favourite heats and guys yeah. you like to surf against, but it was there's just someone who was just an absolute animal. You just go, oh, right. fuck, here we go. Uh, probably like Knackers, Trent Munro and, and Andy. <laughs> Andy, Mick and Joel. Yeah. Yeah, they were just – and Davo. Davo, Chris Davo. So there's quite a few there, but – those guys, um, because before like priority and stuff before man heats that would come out for sure. Any more there for you, Smith? Uh, Matt McCrory wants to know how many pro surfers have have you made cry? Four. Got to be a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The Souza must have been uh, blubbering after that ten. Yeah, I don't know. Um, hmm. Last one. Go for it. All right. I think this is a really good one, actually. And this is uh, from Straight Up Surf Barca Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona. Uh, question. Who carries the hogness in the next generation of CT surfers? Who, Ooh, who in the next question. gen are you looking at going, oh, yeah, I can, I can sense a bit of hog mongrel in this bloke? Mm. Or Sheila, woman, mm. girl. Who's on the rise who you just love to watch surf, mate? I love watching Ryan Callanan. Mm. You know, um, just the yeah, the flair and the passion. I think he kind of really lifts to the occasion. I think he's got that within him. Um, 
maybe a little more kind of friendly and humble and quietly spoke around the edges. But when he gets the rashy on, and it can happen, he's got the fire and the passion, and he's got so much um, intent and um, riding on his performance. Mm. You know, he brings so much to it with his family dynamics and off, often on the tour. And I really like his story, and I think he can he can go all the way. Hoggy, mate, it has been a pleasure. You're, uh, you, you're a swelling and spirit animal in a very literal sense. And uh, we've loved every second of having you on with us, mate. Stoke and boys, thank you so much. Me. Continue on the good path, my friend. And I can't yeah. wait to share a few orbs with you. Smithy, look forward up to the that. hog, up the fucking swellings. Absolute pleasure, mate. Thank you. Right on, boys. Thank you. Yes. Smithy. Kidding me? Are you kidding me? You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. You're kidding me. You're kidding me. You're kidding me, right? Are you kidding me? This guy, are you kidding me? 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 You gotta be kidding me. 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 Oh, you gotta be kidding me! You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. Gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me, right? You gotta be kidding me. What? You gotta be kidding me! You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me! You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Come on, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You kidding me, right? Are you kidding me? You kidding me. You kidding me? Kidding me? Are you kidding me? Kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You fucking kidding me? Are 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 you fucking kidding me? You've got to be fucking kidding me. Are you fucking kidding me?